Mac Power Users, episode 466, John Gruber Returns. Welcome back to Mac Power Users. I'm Stephen Hackett, and I'm joined, as always, by my pal, David Sparks. How are you today, David? Great, Stephen. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. We're going to have a, a fun interview today. We are joined by the Internet's own John Gruber. John, how are you? Good. Happy to be here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it's it's first interview uh, show of the sort of the the new lineup here at Mac Power Users, and we were so excited that you said yes. So thanks for joining us. Well, I'm happy to be back. Before we dive in, uh, we did want to remind people that we are going to be doing a live show on March the 2nd. It's a Saturday in Chicago. Uh, as I say this, there are only a few tickets left. Uh, so if you uh, head over to that link, you can get one of the last ones. Uh, we do have a waiting list so if people drop off or get sick or whatever. Uh, we'll be releasing those tickets if any come available. Uh, so be sure to go check out that link and we will see you in Chicago. Hmm. I love doing live shows. I don't. I, I always think and then... It's like I do my show at uh, WWDC, mm -hmm. and I'm a, I'm a nervous wreck, and it's <laughs> exhaust, mentally exhausting, and and then it's over. So far, everyone has has been okay at least, and then there's that great sense of relief of okay, as long as somebody gives me a you know like a thumbs up, like the show's over, thanks for coming, and then you know like somebody just guarantee me that we got that recorded <laughs> and, it's like, yeah. you know, and it's like i get like a thumbs up from from jake you know the camera guy like we're good and our cable caleb my sound guy and then it's such a relief and then i think man that was so much fun everybody was cheering and stuff i should do that more often and then you know. <laughs> it's a cycle but there's you, actually a lost episode of the mac power users we had um rob cordry on the show and it was live at MacWorld years and years ago I remember that Macworld because I remember uh, uh, it's actually when I met Rob Cordry. Yeah, that was really fun. I was walking around the floor with him, and all the nerds knew me, and everybody else <laughs> knew Rob. Everybody, that is very funny. <laughs> but the uh, but we, we before we started recording the show, I kind of got in an argument with the sound guy because I had a Zoom recorder. I'm like, "Can you just plug it in the board right here?" I said, "I'll, I'll plug it in for you." I brought the cords. I just want to get a recording of the show off the board. You know. Sure. Right. And he's like, no, 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 I can do it, I can do it. I'm like, well, just let me do it for you. And because with the uh, Zoom recorder, at least the one they had at that time, you had to press the record button twice to record. It was super intuitive user interface. <laughs> what could go wrong? Yeah, exactly. And of course, of course. And then part of me was like, I should just have somebody hold a recorder in the audience just anyway. Right. And I didn't. And of course, it didn't get recorded. And it was <laughs> one of the funniest episodes we ever had. So. Yeah, Rob Cordry, you got to actual talent <laughs> yeah i know exactly we'll have to get him back we do a bunch of them at relay now in fact we have like four or five scheduled for this year and i've gotten to a point where i record it on the table so like the recorder is right in front of me and i just like sound guy here's just the signal out of my recorder but i've gotten to a point where i trust no one maybe that's cynical but i don't want to be in that position so it's like i just have it here on the table i can see the numbers going up i see the bars and audio hijack moving i feel like i'm safe and sound. Yeah. It's nerve wracking. It's like, if you did it every day, you'd, you know, you'd have confidence in it, but when you only mm -hmm. do it occasionally and it's always a different, if it's a different venue and oh my right. God, now, now I'm sweaty just thinking about it. <laughs> and then when there's some guy that you've never met before saying, don't worry, I got it covered. Yeah, I yeah. know. That's, I know. <laughs> that's the worst. Well, well, John, I, I would expect a lot of our audience knows you, but for those who don't, John is the um, the proprietor of Daring Fireball. Um, I, we had John on on episode 256, and we went into his origin story quite a bit then. But um, uh, John is a uh, is a programmer, a com you know, computer professional who has been really a professional writer now, probably longer than you were a computer professional at this point Yeah, um, over at Daring Fireball and just one of the most intuitive commenters on the Apple ecosystem and, and the big and small picture at Apple and just been around a long time in this community actually worked on BB edit, which is, you know, gives you real chops in my, in my opinion. <laughs> um, the, uh, and, and just really been around a long time and, and, um, and just, I think one of everybody's favorite commenters on all things Apple. Oh, that's very sweet of you. 16 years at Daring Fireball. Yeah. Wow. I mean, who would have thought, right? When you started it? Well, I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you think you'd be doing it in 16 years? Uh, 
I would have, if you would have come and told me that I, I would have, you know, I would have been, I wouldn't have been surprised. It was more or less the goal. Like I always had in my back of my head, I really didn't want to, um, I didn't want to parlay it into say getting hired at Macworld or, or, you know, yeah. or the New York times or whatever. I, I really, I didn't want to turn it into a job. I wanted it to be my job just because it's, I, I'm, I'm not very good working for other people. <laughs> To be honest, <laughs> but I mean, you've been doing it now for a long time, and and as we talked about in that last episode, which I got wrong, it was two sixty four, not two fifty six. Um, oh. Well, that ruins <sighs> that ruins the binary joke. I know, I know. Well, we know now. We don't have to worry about me coming back on five twelve. There we go. <laughs> There we go. But the, uh, but you were, you were working in kind of publishing in college, yeah. like so many in our community, you worked in the college newspaper. Steven was right there with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes I, I still dream about Cork Express, you know, wake up sort of sweaty and shaking. It's fine. I loved Cork Express. I, I, I loved it like, uh, as much or more as I love any app, including like BB Edit, I, I I don't know. I don't know. I don't get the hate that Quark got. I get the hate that the company got. Yeah. I don't get the. I don't get the hate for the app. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I sort of exaggerate. I, I liked that it was at least once you sort of learned the way it worked, it would get out of the way in, mm-hmm. in, in a sense that I never got that sense in something like InDesign, which my my college paper actually moved to after I. Uh, sort of retired from the being in charge of the layout. I moved on, and apparently, like the first semester, they moved uh, to like a full Adobe stack. I, I was still clinging onto Quark, but you know, it was a thing. Like once you got it sort of wired into your fingers, I at least could just absolutely fly laying out pages. Yeah, same here. Yeah, same here. I think I, I don't, I, David. You maybe you remember. I don't remember the single thing I talked to you about the last time I was on. <laughs> so if I told this story before, you can do it. It's okay. It's been a long time. People. Uh, uh, forget as well but you know in terms of being a power user like the one thing in a we we drexel's triangle was i don't know what i don't read it anymore so i don't know but it, i don't even know if they publish a paper i mean i know that the triangle's still there i don't maybe they're just a website i don't even know but we were a weekly newspaper every friday morning a new a new edition would come out and in a production environment it's like you you either get good at really using quirk express or you're out, you know, like you have to use the app the right way. Like you have to use style sheets. You can't just sit there and f- select text and change the font and stuff. Right. Um, and so, you know, and you just learn those shortcuts. I like, God, I haven't used Quark. I bet I haven't, I haven't had a computer that could launch it in forever. You know, like I, I don't, I don't, cause I, I mean, this is all back in the classic era, but I still remember like you held down the option key to, to get the hand so you can move around the, pasteboard without scrolling, you know, using the scroll bar. I mean, this is before trackpads, right? But like Quark had a way of doing what we now take for granted with like a trackpad with a mouse. And what I remember is I got out of college and didn't really want to get a real job. Uh, I just wanted to sit around playing video games and stuff. Uh, and there was, you could get like temp work doing graphic design stuff. And it paid pretty well. I don't know, it paid like $15, $20 an hour. And it would just be like, you know, somebody needs to hire a graphic designer for a week or something like that. Um, and so I went and they give you like a test, like here, see if you know how to use the app. And it was, <laughs> it was like absolutely absurd. I, I thought, well, you know, who doesn't know how to do this? And it turns out like all the kids coming out of art school, like all the art school students, they had no idea how to use the apps and they'd come in and they just, cause they, you have like all semester to do a project. So they, they don't know how to use style sheets. You know, everything is just use the font menu. Um, mm-hmm. and so it was like, it was like, I became like the ace, you know, like the number one person to like send in on like these, you know, gorilla one day design jobs and all because of, you know, and again, no formal training at all. It's just that the, the rigors of a real newspaper and a real, a real hard deadline, you know, nothing, nothing helps you learn like a deadline. John, John Gruber, John Gruber, Cork Express strike team <laughs> did you parachute in <laughs> yeah more or less usually it was so, usually it was just a horribly mundane stuff it wasn't like an emergency it was like uh just drudgery but i mean we the my college paper we published four times a week and so we had just a single night to turn it around i think that's right. an interesting angle and in like the what makes a power user conversation is like so much of it is the tools you can use but how quickly you can move through them and produce quality work like to your point is like you either get it done 
first or you get it, you know, get it done the best or you don't get the job necessarily. Or if you were like in my, in my paper, if the paper wasn't to bed at 3 a.m., it wasn't going to be on stands at 7 a.m., right? Like we had hmm. to hit that deadline. And under that like sort of time pressure cooker, you move quickly because, because you have to. And it was, uh, you know, there was a time in my life where I, I'm sure that I could, uh, you know, lay out a, an eight or 16 page paper in the matter of a couple of hours. And people watching me would think I was on, you know, some sort of, some sort of drugs. <laughs> like, how, how is he doing this so quickly? But you have to do it when you're in that environment. You know, in 2019, nobody talks about style sheets, but I'm the lawyer in the room and I use Microsoft Word all the time. And those are still a good thing, you know, yeah. using style sheets if you're doing any kind of word layouts. If I just, just the other day, I got a, a very carefully assembled document. I put together, you know, like 20 pages and the bows on the other side just started going at it willy nilly, ignoring oh. my style sheets. Uh, just selecting I wanted, text. And, uh. Yes. I, I wanted to throw things. It's like, no. come on. It's not that hard. <laughs> but I, I guess you guys, uh, that's kind of a weird conversation to the guy that invented Markdown. How so? Well, I mean, you don't. You probably don't do many style sheets at this point. You write, oh, no, don't you write no. mainly in text? Yeah. yeah. And and we talked about that on the last episode. But John Gruber wrote Markdown, gang. <laughs> you know the thing that comes up on the show every few episodes, <laughs> and every iOS developer seems to have incorporated into their text editor. Yeah, it's how, crazy. How does that? Feel? Did you ever expect that to become such a thing when you made it? It the arc of Markdown's success is. It, fascinating to me like daring fireball success is just it was just a long slow steady rise you know like it it you know i started in 2002 and it was you know it, it just seemed like more people were reading it on a regular basis there was never really like a slow or a, a hockey sh- stick state slope you know uh whereas markdown came out and I remember specifically when it, because uh, I had been talking to D- Dean Allen and, uh, you know, who created Textile, which was a very similar idea to Markdown. And it, it came out first. And, uh, and I was talking to him, uh, and there was a guy from Six Apart. I forget his name. Sorry. <laughs> hope he's not listening. Uh, but the three of us were talking and I had, um, this guy had done like the, the port of textile to movable type. And I started coming up, I had like suggestions for like the next, you know, syntax suggestions for textile. And then like the more I thought about it, they were more significant. And Dean was like, dude, you should just make your own thing. You know, it wasn't like he was annoyed. It was, it was just like, you've got enough ideas here, you know, but it's so different. You should just do your own thing. Um, so I did it, uh, and sad too. It's it's kind of sad because here I am talking about Dean Allen, who's gone, and I worked during Markdown's development with Aaron Swartz, who's also gone. Yeah. Because Aaron had a thing, I forget what his was called, but he had like a. It only did like three things, but it still it did you know paragraphs and bold and italics. Um, and I I I just knew at a certain point while while I was working, I was like, this is good, like I'm really loving writing like this. Um, and then it came out and right before it came out, right before I, I think I had like a public beta for a while. Um, but right before I announced it, Basecamp came out and I knew, you know, the guys there, uh, speaking of Chicago, uh, you know, Jason and DHH, um, Basecamp came out and I didn't know that they were working on it. They kept it secret. Uh, and Basecamp came out and had textile as an option. And I was like, Oh yeah. man, <laughs> Markdown would have been perfect there. And I was like, but too late, you know, cause they came out with it. And, uh, and anyway, it came out and it just did not seem to go anywhere. And I couldn't believe it. I, I was just like, man, I really thought that this was going to be a thing. Like I thought this was going to it, like, once people start using this, they're not going to go back. This is, this is the way to write for the web. I was like, just, I, I've never been more sure of anything in, in my life, uh, like that I've worked on. And it just seemed to go nowhere, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe it. And then I, I don't know what happened somewhere, you know, four or five years into it, it like had trickled out to enough places and then just sort of exploded in popularity. It's a very strange arc. Uh, it really, to me, seemed like a failure for a while. 
I know for me, one of the big reasons that I got real religion about Markdown was iOS because, you know, originally there were almost no rich text editors and, you know, just the idea and, you know, syncing wasn't really that great at the beginning. The idea of, of reducing file sizes to just simple text files and having things that could work across platforms. Um, some of the original iOS apps that, that adopted are what really made me start using it a lot. And I bet that I'm not alone there. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, although it's funny because I don't really do much Markdown in iOS. Almost never, really. Uh, so, like, there's all these Markdown text editors for iOS, and I I don't really use any of them. <laughs> like, if I need to, I go to – I think IA Writer is the one that I go to because it just is, it does syntax coloring, and it's the pretty simple. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, I was just using it the other day, actually, though, and I couldn't figure out how to rename a document. I mean, it's like – I don't know. I we could go into it, but it's, it was just another one of those moments where I, like I always say on my show, like sometimes when I try doing work on an iPad, I feel like I'm wearing mittens. Yeah. I do want to talk to you about iOS in a little bit, but I, I, it is, um, I you mean, it's funny, you know, what, I, I don't want to interrupt, but sure. it's funny because we were talking about Quirk Express. I actually had the idea for something like Markdown, uh, back in college, because if you were, Quirk had a, they probably still do if they're around, but there's, there, there's a text format they have called tags or something express tags and it's you know uh, it, it it's one of those weird things where quirk came in the world you know like the late 80s early 90s before the web and so everything wasn't at, at html or xml so it was a text thing with tags but they didn't look like html at all i forget what the punctuation was for it and i mean you would never and it was a format you'd never want to write by hand it wasn't visually it wasn't like markdown but i wanted to write something like markdown that would turn something human readable into quirk express tags and just i just never got around to it yeah i spent years working in word perfect for dos which is uh the the old the old lawyers in the audience are getting excited right now but the uh but it was in some ways that you would code in your formatting with right. with text i mean it was it was similar in fact there's a lot of people that got angry when they started moving to graphical user interfaces, because right. they felt like they were so good with the codes that they didn't want to, they want to change anything. Well, I, I remember using, I don't even remember the syntax, but uh, there was a, uh, what, I don't even know what the, it was a, a word processor for the Apple II from Apple. What the heck was it called? Uh, they had like a spreadsheet and a database all in one. Uh, you know, yes, the, it was like the works Apple works was Apple it? works. That was it. Yeah. yeah. Apple works. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking Claris works, but I knew that was the Mac, but it was Apple works. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the word processor worked like that. And in a way it was so exciting then when, you know, to, when the Mac came of being and it was like, Holy crap, this is amazing. Cause your document, you know, WYSIWYG was, it was yeah. a sensation when it happened. It was like, Oh my God, the thing on your screen looks exactly like it's going to, when it comes out of the printer. And, but in other ways though, you know, unsurprising for the guy who ended up making Markdown, there was always something dissatisfying about WYSIWYG because it's like, or not dissatisfying, but it, it, uh, nagging in the back of your head that maybe, you know, like you, you, if you select a word and make it bold and italic, right. And then you go on and then you put the insertion point at the end of that word and type space and start typing again. Is it going to continue being bold and italic or is that space between the bold and italic and the non bold italic, you know, there's an ambiguity that is yeah. uh, sometimes frustrating in a WYSIWYG thing. Like you're not getting what you thought. Whereas in a tag thing, you know, precisely where the italics end. Cause there's the yep. little marker that shows you where it is. That's the, that's exactly what the word perfect gang was excited about. Right. And, and the problem with the WYSIWYG is like, if you go in that space and you type on to the end of that word, you may suddenly get bold and you didn't right. expect to. And so, you know, then you got to deal with that. What, what did, did you ever seriously compute on an Apple II? I mean, or did, were you, did you start on the Mac? No, I started on Apple II. I, I, I've told this story many times. My parents, I grew up, I didn't own a computer until I went to college in 1991. Uh, not because I didn't want one, but because my parents wouldn't buy me one. Sure. And they wouldn't buy it for me because they said, if we buy you a computer, you're never going to leave the house. <laughs> 
Like I had other friends that wanted a computer and their parents were like, ah, that's too much money. You know, and the Apple II was very, you know, you know, yeah. some, some stories never changed. The Apple IIs were very expensive compared to like a Commodore 64 or something. And so there, were, I had friends who wanted an Apple II and, you know, they're like, well, we'll get you a Commodore, you know, that's cheaper. Uh, my parents wouldn't buy me any of them. And it wasn't because they thought I wouldn't use it. It was because <laughs> they thought I'd never leave the house. I remember at one point I was so desperate. I was begging my parents to buy me a Timex Sinclair. And um, gang, if you want to see a crappy computer, look up a Timex Sinclair on the internet. <laughs> we'll put a link in the show notes. It wasn't even a real, it was like a tiny keyboard with a thermal printer. It's not great, man. <laughs> it's not good. You should have aimed higher, but was David. A, but it was $100 and it could program basic. So that was, I, that would get me going. That's what yeah. I thought. Was it the same Timex as the watch company? Yeah. Yeah. They made a computer. <laughs> they, they made Isn't it that go bizarre? at it, man. I remember it. I, I just never really thought about it, you know, but it is kind of bizarre. You could get it at Jimco. I now remember. The com- <laughs> now the computer companies are making watches. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Full circle, baby. Full circle. All the way back around. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Gazelle.com, the go-to website for buying and selling used devices. Are you thinking about upgrading to a new iPhone? Gazelle will pay you for your current phone. Visit gazelle.com and answer a few easy questions to get a quote. Your quote is good for 30 days, so you can lock in the best price before it depreciates and have time to decide which phone you want. Shipping is free and payment is fast. Get a check in the mail, an Amazon gift card in your inbox, or a direct deposit into your PayPal account. You can also shop a variety of certified pre-owned electronics or trade devices in for cash. Give a new life to used devices. Visit gazelle.com today. I've been using Gazelle to sell my devices for years, and I just really love that they're a trusted online marketplace. That means I just fill in the quote, they send me a box, and I send them my stuff, and I get money. There's no weirdness involved like you get when you try and do some of these trading systems or some of these other online sellers where you suddenly get a buyer who wants to pay less or gives you complaints. With Gazelle, you just trade in your old devices for cash. If you've got a drawer of old iPhones or iPads sitting around your house, why not convert them to money with Gazelle? Simply visit gazelle.com and find out instantly what your device is worth. You'll get a quote right away. All online offers are free. Simply answer a few easy questions to get your instant price quote. Shipping is also free and payment is fast. Gazelle also accepts Samsung Galaxy S9, iPhone 8, iPhone 10, MacBooks, and more. So lock in the value of your phone and trade it in for cash, or buy a certified pre-owned device for a fraction of the price. That's gazelle.com, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Visit gazelle.com today and get started. We've got a link in the show notes and let them know you heard about it at the Mac Power Users. So, so John, we talked about uh, Daring Fireball being 16 years old and, and sort of how you started it. But I'm interested in to see uh, how how it sort of operates today. You know, how, how do you, as John Gruber, decide what ends up on Daring Fireball and how that process goes from from research all the way through publication? I don't know how to explain it. I really don't. Uh, you know, I, I, I read a lot. I mean, I guess that's where it starts. Uh, you know, and I've always been a voracious reader and my, my weakness as an employee, uh, working for somebody else is always, always, you know, it's hard not to, uh, waste time reading, you know, it's just a fantastic way to procrastinate, you know, and it's, part of what makes this a, 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 a nearly ideal job for me personally is that part of the job necessitates that I read tons and tons of stuff. Um, you know, and I'm always looking for interesting things to link to, uh, either a, because it is such interesting news that I want to make sure that the people who read Daring Fireball see it or B that I have something witty to add or an observation or a criticism of it. Uh, Hopefully both. Hopefully it's both an interesting thing to link to and I have something to add. Uh, but like, I don't have a quota uh, and, you know, it, it, what it is that makes me decide to hit publish, you know, you know, there's always a lot of hmm, maybe. And sometimes a lot of times what I'll do earlier in the day is just sort of bookmark it. Um, 
and come back to it later. And sometimes, you know, there's something that I'll bookmark and think I'm, I'm, I should definitely link to that. And then two hours later, I look at it again and I think, eh, maybe not worth it. And I can't explain it. It's a total gut instinct, you know, and for longer pieces, that's also hard to say. I don't know. I've, you know, I've never run out. I like the idea, my list of draft ideas for longish, longer to longish articles probably continues to grow. It's, it's probably, and there's probably as almost as many of them as there are articles, um, you know, and then eventually one of them, it just irritates me, you know, or, or I just feel compelled to finish it or to write it and publish it. Uh, sometimes if I go a week or longer and there hasn't really been, I feel like there hasn't been a really good DF piece. It's, it's just a compulsion to rectify it by trying to, you know, hit one hard. You know, I think, I think maybe you're harder on yourself on that, but as a reader, someone who's, who's read you for a really long time, Daring Fireball has an internal consistency. Like there's a, there is a, a universe in which it lives. And, and clearly that's defined by this, this gut feeling you're describing where like very rarely, if ever, is there something on the site that I, as a reader think, oh, well that, that one's not for me, or I don't find that as interesting as he did. You know, I think you've done a really good job at sort of whatever that definition is, you know, it, it may be hard to explain, but as a reader, like I get the sense that that exists and I can feel that as someone who's read it for a long time. It's good to hear. I mean, that's definitely what I'm shooting for. I mean, and it's partly why I'd never have had a, like a guest poster or anything like that. Um, not because I don't think there's other people who are good at it, but it's, it, it's so personal, right? There is, a, there's, and it, it's, there's an ineffable quality to it, you know? I mean, part of it too is like, I always describe it as, uh, like a column, you know, I've always said that, you know, and I, as a kid growing up, I always thought being a column, like a newspaper magazine columnist was like just the best, uh, you know, and, and I've said this when I've talked about my work before, I mean, in, you know, some ways the novelist is certainly, and certainly in Western culture is held up as like the, the apex of the writing hierarchy. Um, you know, and I, I enjoy reading novels, uh, although I don't read anywhere near as much as I used to. Um, but I never, it never thought to me, it never seemed to me like I would write a novel. I don't know why. I mean, it's hypothetically something I could still do. It's, I'm not going to, it's not like out there, but like writing a column, you know, where your opinion is in it and you have a style, uh, and even like a beat, you know, it's, that always seemed like something I could do. Like it, and it came to me naturally. And part of that then is even if I don't have a longer piece that is itself a column to me, like a, an entire day at Daring Fireball should read like a column, you know, and there were, there was like, I don't know what you would just, I don't think there was ever a word for it, but you know, like in the newspaper era, there were, uh, do you guys remember Larry King's column for USA Today? Larry King, the CNN guy, had a column in USA Today. And it was like wackadoo because it was never like he'd think of an idea. And this week, it, Larry King's column was about, you know, uh, the situation in Iraq or something. It was just like a series of unrelated paragraphs. Like, and he, he would just say like item and then, you know, like a bit of gossip about Jaja Zsa Gabor. Uh, and then, you know, it's just like, it, you could just imagine that he like had like a little notebook and like, he just, they were, they were like tweets really, really. If you think about it, it was, uh, it, Larry King was writing like a 700 word weekly column that was pretty much consisted of like, eh, like a dozen or two tweets every week. Uh, and it worked in a weird way. Like people may, you know, it was often the subject of, <laughs> cause he, he's a goofy guy, you know, it's, it was kind of goofy. It wasn't good. But I found it compelling. Like it would actually make me try to look for USA Today once in a while, just because I I, I loved reading. It was to me the, by far and away the most interesting thing in USA Today because it was actually it it wasn't that that bland plastic USA Today style. It was you know the thoughts of one crazy person. And so I've always thought of Daring Fireball more like that. Even on a day when I don't, I may not write one long piece, but added up together, everything should feel like it makes sense to read it all together. 
Like here's today's thoughts. I do feel like there's threads of your ideas about Apple and other things that, that go through even the small links. A lot of times they reinforce whatever thread you're on. And I, uh, I like that. It's one thing that's weird is, is before I started daring fireball, um, I knew the web, you know, was obviously something I was interested in. I wanted to write, you know, and I, you know, was in college when the web went from not being a thing to being a thing. Like I, (laughs) Like, it's good that I didn't, a lot of these things aren't on the record. Like I was just talking to a friend the other day about, uh, gopher you guys. Remember gopher? Yes. Oh man. That is old. I remember that now. It yes. A protocol, you know, like in the FTP or, you know, before any kind of security it, you, you know, put it in the show notes and let people look it up. But it was sort of like an early attempt at the web. It was like a way you'd put up a gopher server and your gopher yes. server could have like our school, new, my student newspaper had a gopher, you know, we, we had gopher versions of the articles for a while and it never took off like never took off in a way that you know this is like the era of the internet when you did everything through a terminal interface everything you know you'd connect via a modem and you'd be typing on a command line thing and you'd do your email and elm and you'd you know read your news groups on screen you know in a terminal i actually played an online dice game with a bunch of nerds via gopher like in 19 I don't know, like, was it 88, maybe? I don't know. It was a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. In some ways, like Brent Simmons and I have talked about it. Like, in some ways, email has never gotten has never gotten back to where it was then. Email was so wonderful to use in that era. Because uh, there was, it was just, just plain text. Uh, yeah. And you could do it all in a terminal window. And it felt like you could just fly through your email and you just hit R, you know. And, uh, there's all sorts of shortcuts in NetNewsWire that are, that are inspired by that era, like that you didn't have to do like a command key R you just hit R and that was the reply. Uh, and then all of a sudden you were already in your editor ready to, you know, everything quoted that we wanted quoted, ready to, ready to reply. Um, but the best features about Gmail, I mean, is they've got those quick uh, key combinations. So anyway, the web happened, obviously my prediction that it was never going to surpass gopher. That was where I was going is I was like, this, this is interesting that you can have graphics, but why in the world would you, it's so much, it's so slow. That was the thing. I was like, this is so ridiculously slow. I just, no way it's going to, you know, there's no way it's going to beat gopher. So here we are. But anyway, I knew I wanted to, I, I knew that the web was for me and, and, you know, it, it, not that I predicted that print was going to die, but it, it suited me. Web was something that I could do by myself. I could just do it. I could make a website and I didn't have to ask permission. I didn't have to go and uh, try to get a job as a reporter and work my, you know, work for decades to try to get a land a column on the newspaper or something. I could just do it. Um, but I was obsessed with format, you know, like, and, and coming from the newspaper world, I just thought you needed like editions, you know, like you, you every week you'd come out with a new edition of your website. Uh, and that, you know, it, it's obvious it, 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 it never, it turned out that was, that was wrong. Right. Nobody, almost nobody does that these days. Right. How many websites do you know of that kind of come out with like a weekly issue? Right. It just, it's just not suited to the medium. Uh, but it always bothered, it somehow bothered me that like early blogs were chronological newest on top. Cause if you read, if you read today at daring fireball, you're reading the last thing I wrote, right? If you start reading it like, you know, 10 o'clock at night, what did, uh, what did Gruber post today? You're going to read it backwards. And it bothered me. And it, you know, it, it, it just turns out that it's fine. People will get it. How, how are you getting the writing done these days? I mean, are you, um, I, I assume you're writing it in plain text. Yeah. Uh, mostly Mars edit on the Mac. Uh, and then, uh, uh, BB edit when it's longish or if I need to do footnotes or something. It's funny because Mars edit doesn't even do markdown syntax coloring. <laughs> yeah. I would imagine you don't, you don't need the syntax coloring. You probably understand. Oh, it. I make mistakes. I, I make mistakes all the time. I've, I, I publish, uh, markdown typos super frequently. I've had this idea. It's, I mean, markdown is what, 14 years old. I've had the, for 13 and a half years, I've had the idea of writing like a, a lint checker. Uh, what was it? Remember there was something, I forget what we used to use that was called Lint. It was, I think it was for C programming is you could uh, pass a program through Lint and it would catch it, it, certain types of uh, things that like the compiler would technically pass, but it would, you know, maybe it was a bad idea or something. Uh, uh, 
just something so that before I hit publish, it just double checks that every link that I'm every reference to a URL that I have actually it exists in the document. And 13 and a half years later, I still haven't written. I just, <laughs> I just wait, I just publish. And then I go to Twitter and see if anybody reports a typo. <laughs> yeah, that's usually how it works. So for me, I don't see, you know, I can read over it and Mars edit or an I write or wherever a dozen times. And then I don't see the typo until it's live on the site or in the podcast feed. It's like, oh, great. Now that a bunch of people have seen it. Now I see it for the first time. It's, it's always how it goes. Something about just hitting that publish button that just completely fixes your vision. It's like, oh, yeah. I don't, I don't know what it is. <laughs> and so, you, so, at any one time, you've probably got a couple long ones you're working in BB Edit, and then the short yep. ones you're working out of Mars Edit. Yep. Makes sense. Yep. Yeah. And I have still- a little bookmarklet, or not even a bookmarklet anymore. It's actually a, a Safari extension, but, you know, and it, it takes, uh, you know, selected text in the front window, you know, so I click one button and it creates a new post with the title filled in with the title of the tab, the URL in the URL field and whatever selected text I have already as a markdown style block quote. One of my favorite kinds of posts you write is sometimes you'll link something and you will write a post about it that is one sentence or less. And sometimes you just nail it. And I love it when you do that. Is that a, something you, you try to do or does that just once in a while come, come to you? I, 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 I try to be as brief as possible, you know, and sometimes I just don't know what to say and it pops into my head. I thought I had one this week that I thought was like that and was really good when it, the news came out of a, Apple having a deal with uh, Samsung to get iTunes built into Samsung TV sets. And Samsung had a press release with a, you know, a complimentary quote from Eddie Q. Uh, and I, I didn't know what to make. I mean, I was certainly surprised and I was interested. I still don't really know what to, quite to make of the whole the Apple, what the hell is Apple doing with TV broad, big picture. Um, but I knew I wanted to link to it. And then I thought of the quote from it, you know, maybe if this had happened six months from now, it wouldn't have been in my mind, but we, our family's favorite Christmas movie is Christmas vacation. And there's a line that Clark says where his cousin Eddie shows up and, you know, buffoon, the buffoon cousin Eddie. And he says, you surprised Clark? And he says, Eddie, I, I wouldn't be more surprised if I woke up tomorrow with my head stapled to the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I did is all I, all I did is I quoted a little bit of the news. And then all I did was quote Clark was rolled from that line. And then the fact that it's cousin Eddie, I would have used that quote anyway. But the fact that it's Eddie and Eddie, even though they spell it it's, different ways, it's perfect. Right? Sure. <laughs> it was perfect. Yeah. Like, cause I was, I was truly surprised. I was truly surprised by, by, by that announcement. And, you know, I, I, I guess I do try to do that. I mean, and it is, it, it's the benefit of this format that I've more or less come up with at Daring Fireball that I, I can write a one sentence thing and it works. Right. And it gets back to what I said, where it's really, the the optim you know the ideal reader in my mind is somebody who's very busy way too busy to spend their whole day dicking around on the internet and so maybe at the end of the day when they're done doing their work uh at a real job they can go to daring fireball and just read the homepage. you know make a new window load daring fireball and then start opening the ones they want to read in browser tabs but then they can read it straight through but then i can fit in like a one-liner like that because i don't have to each each individual post doesn't have to have some kind of 700 word minimum. Like it drives me nuts how many websites, everything that they post has to be a, quote unquote an article, even if they're not adding anything. Yeah. I, you know, I, but you have an, you have a voice and an impact because I was talking to a friend who was fairly high up at Apple, who was telling me that, oh yeah, sometimes something goes up at during fireball and suddenly weekends are rescheduled. You know, I mean, you still, you, you've got people's ear up in Cupertino. I think I got, I, I hate to take credit for it. I really do. I mean, that's why it's, I would never do this on my show, but I think I got, I'm pretty sure really, frankly, I mean, actually I know I got, I got Safari to get, uh, fav icons in the browser tabs. Yeah. I believe that. I, I, I it, it really was, you know, it was years. It, there was apparently somebody within the decision-making chain who objected to it for years on, aesthetic grounds, you know, that, you know, all these, any, any random fav icon of all these colors is, would look terrible on, in there. And, uh, 
you know, it was apparently one one person who more or less kept it out of Safari for years. Uh, and I certainly wanted it because uh, it's, I don't know, I'm just a visual thinker. But then I found out when I wrote about it, uh, the thing that was really eye opening for me was how many people wrote to me on Twitter and email readers who said that they, uh, they use Chrome because it has fab icons in the tabs. And if Safari, they'd love to switch to Safari, but they can't because it doesn't have, uh, fab icons. And that sounds silly and petty, but once you're used to it, I, I can kind of see it. And it's especially for some people who have like, tr you know, tend to have like one window with 20 or 30 or more tabs, all, all you can see sometimes is the fav icon. You don't even get a usable amount of text, right? And so many websites have terribly structured page titles. So the page title text isn't useful anyway, right? Yeah. Um, and apparently that got it through. Like the idea that they're actually losing share to Chrome, even if, you know, if two, 3%, you know, but you could add this feature as an option. Uh, yeah. Makes sense. Do, do you use that pin feature that they added as well, where you can pin a tab? No, yeah, I don't just... understand that feature. I, 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 I mean, I guess I understand it technically, but I don't see the appeal of it at all. I, and sometimes people send me screenshots, and I see them have like six of those pin tabs, and I'm, I, I don't get that. No, well, it I, feels to me like an outgrowth of favicons. Like if there's yeah. websites you go to all the time, you know. You well, that was a, it. it's a funny story, and it's very Apple-y. Is so the pin tabs have had icons forever, but they're monochrome. And it, it, it's like the sort of thing that only Apple would do is like they, you have to specify them in SVG. So they're vector, which is great in theory. SVG is a great format. It's super small and it's really high fidelity. Uh, and vector is great because it's, you know, they can make it bigger. They can go, th they can go to three X resolution, you know, retina resolution in it. The SVG will just work. But it's like every every browser in the universe uses the same you know ping format for fav icons and they're full color. And Apple invented a monochrome vector f format and expected every website in the world to adopt it just for Safari. And it was just Safari on Mac. I have to do a follow up on it, but I had a post a week or a couple of weeks ago about uh, using Apple Script to get a new tab in Safari next to your current tab, as opposed to making it all the way at the yes. end of the right yeah. end of the window. And uh, I have to do an update, but I think it, something goes terribly wrong if the current tab is a pin tab. And I, I had no idea because I don't use them. So I have to, uh, there's an hmm. easy fix for it, but I well, was like, oh, you, yeah, have to get that, you have to get that published so we can get the Safari team cracking on fixing yeah. that problem too <laughs> without Apple Script. This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by Text Expander from Smile. Text Expander multiplies your team's productivity, making up-to-date shared knowledge available instantly. So say that you have a team and they're communicating with customers or the public. You can now use Text Expander to make sure all of their common responses are accessible and searchable through simple abbreviations and keyboard shortcuts. These can be written and edited by your best writers for a consistent communication across all your employees. And of course, it's available on multiple platforms, so you can share these snippets with everyone on your team, whether you're using macOS, iOS, Windows, or even the web. And of course, Text Expander keeps everything in sync, so these snippets are updated immediately everywhere when modified. Using Text Expander will change your team's life, making them more productive and leaving time for what you do best. At Relay FM, we're using this with our, our sales manager and Mike and I to make sure that common things that we send to sponsors are all formatted the same. We've taken care of common typos and miscapitalizations and that sort of stuff in sponsor names for a nice, clean, consistent communication with our sponsors. And with Text Expander keeping it all in sync, I know that everyone is always up to date. And if you have a larger team than just three, like we do at Relay, Text Expander supports single sign on for really fast access to everyone. So go to textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more and sign up and be sure to tell them you came from Mac Power Users. That's textexpander.com slash podcast. Our thanks to Text Expander for their support of this show and Relay FM. So you've got Daring Fireball been running a long time, but uh, over the years you have added uh, sort of a, a second project to your plate being the talk show and uh, it's it's a podcast. It is out a handful of times a month, and uh, the way you describe it has always been interesting to me uh, as a commentary track 
for Daring Fireball. And uh, that fits really neatly with what you've been saying about sort of the content you want to do on Daring Fireball. But but sort of what is that process? Like, how do you decide when one thing is like mainstream and the other is on this sort of side project? Like, uh, what's the relationship between those two entities? Well, it's hard to say. I find... <laughs> I'm not trying to make you guys feel guilty, but I find podcasting to be mentally exhausting. I, it, it never, it does not come naturally to me. Uh, I don't think I'm bad at it. I don't think I was bad at the beginning. You know, I think I have some kind of ability that translates okay to, you know, this conversational type thing, but I've, I, and I've, Jason Snell and I have talked about this a lot, you know, but it's, it, I've always seen myself as a writer who does podcasts. Uh, not a podcaster who writes or even 50 50 but in reality at least financially it is that the podcast actually makes more than the website i mean it's not i don't know i i actually i actually don't know the exact numbers i don't i don't really keep track that well uh but i think it's like 55 45 or something like that um and uh, you know the truth is i could do more episodes i mean it's not qu weekly I think it for a while it was averaging pretty consistently at 40 a year. And I think it's actually dipped. I don't know, a year or two ago, I was like, well, that's, you know, it's, I could, I could get, I'm not going to get to 52 a year, but I was like, I could, I could get closer. And then it, it was like a, so like a new year's resolution was, you know, try to get more talk shows out. And instead <laughs> I actually had like the worst year ever. It was like 36 or 35 or something. And I, I will, to be honest, I think in some ways the, podcast hurts the website in terms of sometimes if there's something bugging me and I get it out in a rant on the talk show, it scratches the itch in a way that the article never gets written. Like if you pay, I don't know if you listen to every episode, but it occurs to me sometimes where I'll say on the show, like I'm working on a piece about X and then we talk about it and I get it off. And then that, that article never appears <laughs> because <laughs> once it's out, right, it's like, I've got to get this thing out, out of my right. mind. But getting it out on the podcast means that I don't get, I'm no longer motivated enough to write it because there's always something else to write that I haven't yet gotten out, right? It like suddenly by saying it on the show, uh, you know, and so it would work best if I only talked on the show about things that I've already written about, but it doesn't work out that way. Like I have a show scheduled with somebody and there's, you know, here's the news of the week and I haven't had time to write about it yet. Well, then, I'll, you know, it would be silly not to talk about it. Um, but then once I do, then I don't write about it. Yeah. I've talked to Federico Vitici a lot about that. We do Connected Together and he writes Max Stories, of course. And he and I both struggle with that too of like, well, I already said it over here. But, you know, the way I think he and I kind of see it is uh, that could definitely be the case. And sometimes it doesn't need to be both places, but sometimes too, it can be interesting to sort of bounce one off the other. Like I talked about it in this context, or we covered this angle of it on the show, but now that I'm here and I can write and I can expand, you know, I've changed my mind about something or, or the story has changed, but it's, I don't think you're alone in that. It, when people have multiple outlets, it can be, like you said, you can sort of scratch the itch and then just move on and sort of forget that you said, Oh, I'm, I'm working on this other thing and it, it never surface. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting for me. I mean, you guys, if, even just casual readers and listeners of my show can tell that there is, a, a, to me, hopefully, at least a sort of interesting yin yang to the styles where Darren Fireball is very, very tightly edited, often very brief, as we talked about a bit ago. And my show is sprawling. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the average episode is. Uh, Todd Vaziri who works at uh, ILM and is a, a friend and a uh, devoted listener of the show uh, occasionally tweets, uh, keeps track of them in Excel and tweets like a graph of the average length of the talk show with John Gruber over time. And it actually went down for a little bit, but now it's actually gone back up. It is a very long show and not tightly edited or scripted or planned. It is, you know, it's the opposite. It's like where my, uh, I always get these mi mixed up. Merlin always straightens me out, but like id and ego and, and that stuff. It's like, that's where my id runs loose. 
Yeah, but it is funny. You talked earlier about how um, it's exhausting podcasting, and you know it's all relative. My my grandfather cut leather in a shoe factory. You know, <laughs> my grandfather was a coal miner, and he died of black lung disease. <laughs> that was my other grandfather. Same thing. <laughs> my mom's dad went to work in a coal mine at the age of fourteen in the middle of Pennsylvania, and put his two kids through, uh, my mom went to nursing school and my, my, her brother was, uh, he didn't go to college, but he, you know, was like an electrician or like, a he worked in computers, um, like a trade school type thing. And his grandchildren all went to college and, and are successful, you know, but the man died of black lung disease after spending a career in coal mines. And yet yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll sit here and tell you how exhausting it is to podcast. Yeah. <laughs> it is yeah. it is absurd. But on the other hand, you know, and he died when I was in first grade, but I he was a very nice man and and was everything you'd ever want in a grandfather. I still have very warm memories of him. And I, you could just, I just know enough and I remember enough that nothing would please him more than to find out that I'm ex you know, <laughs> making a living by coming down to the basement like and yeah and i think of it i do i think of him all the time like i so i podcast in my basement and uh I've, i don't even have a desk it's just like a couple of a couple of cartons and a piece of an old ikea desk i mean i'll send you guys a photo of it you can't you can't publish it but it's just the most ridiculous claptrap setup you, it looks like i just we, we just moved but we've been here for 2 years but it feels like such a waste to buy a desk just for podcasting but my office is acoustically unsuited to doing the show and i i could rectify that and and but like my home office is is lower on our list of rooms to finish uh properly you know but so yeah. i have to come down to the basement but i also uh I'm sitting on one of our kitchen stools and our kitchen's on the second floor. So every time I do a podcast, I've got to carry a chair from the kitchen <laughs> down two floors to the basement. And then when I'm done, pick it back up and I, you know, have a cup of coffee and I have some water and I have to take my MacBook down. So I, it's all it takes a couple of trips because you can't carry out beverages and a chair and, right. and a computer. So it's physically exhausting to record a show. <laughs> well, and it just seems like a lot of work. And then I think, oh my God, that is, this is so not work. But then also, I have plenty of money. I could buy another chair. <laughs> like, the chair. But yet, somehow, in the back of my mind, it seems wasteful. Like, I'll waste money on, on you know, the $75 bottle of scotch. But it, it's like the idea of getting a $70 chair just to podcast from seems wasteful. So I don't do it. <laughs> so if we hear a loud crash in the middle of this, your, your Rube Goldberg desk has fallen over, is what's happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but you have guests on your show. Do you, do you uh, like do outlines and, you know, wh what type of um, software are you using to get the show produced? Uh, just Apple Notes, shared note. Uh, sure. Uh, it depends on the guest. Usually it's just a couple of topics and I just trust that the guest will, will know what to say, you know. And uh, yeah. famously, I never do this on purpose, but it's w one of the running gags on the show is I'll say that something will go in the show notes, but it, <laughs> I don't write it down when I say that. And usually my audio editor, Caleb, will will flag it, you know, but I've always told him, like, he should keep like a sticky note, like, listen for me to say blank is going to be in the show notes and then make, make sure I've put it in the in the show notes. But it's just an Apple note file that I share with whoever's on. And I should also share with Caleb. Um uh, and that's that's really it. Yeah, we started the show talking about our live show that you know we've got ninety people going to. Um, now you do a live show that's got just a few more than ninety at that one every year at WWDC. How, how big is that theater that, that you fill up? Uh, the California Theater, I believe, seats eleven 1 hundred and thirty some people. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then prior to that, when we were in San Francisco, I was at a place called Mezzanine, which sadly, I just, the news came out a couple of weeks ago that they're losing their lease, It's which sucks. That's like the worst way, right? That's like, yeah. like when a restaurant or a place like Mezzanine closes because they're, you know, out of business, well, that's, you know, sad, but that's the way the world works. But they were, you know, like a thriving club and venue, and they've just lost their lease because San Francisco real estate is so insane. Uh, yeah. that the, you know, whoever owns the building doesn't want to, you know, feels like they could build a skyscraper on it or something. Um, that place, I think we used to do around 500. I don't know if you were ever there. It was, it, yeah. it, it's yeah. called mezzanine because it actually had a mezzanine. And so it wasn't a theater it was a club. And so you could sit downstairs and there was a stage, uh, 
And the downstairs experience was roughly like a theater or like a live show. But then on the mezzanine, it was like, you'd have to like watch on TV or something like that. But some people loved it up there because, you know, the line for drinks was shorter. Yeah, I used to go up there and uh, drink and listen to Craig Federighi talk about Photos yeah. app at your, sh- yeah. at your show. <laughs> the California <laughs> yeah. Theater. The California Theater is 1100 plus. So, and, yeah. and, and, and it's a theater. I mean. And it is it, crazy. It's insane because, it, I mean, it does. It sells out. It, it's, it's like WWDC tickets used to be. I mean, I really should like instill like a lottery. Like it, it, I put them on sale and like a minute later they're gone. Well, I mean, famously, you uh, often get the uh, guests from Apple, uh, high end Apple executives to appear. And so, you know, talking about your career, you started out as a columnist and then you turned into a, a kind of a radio show host, I guess what you call us podcasters. But now, you know, you've got something else entirely. It's like a variety hour of Mac nerdiness. I mean, yeah. uh, how did you, how do you prep for that? It's hard. Uh, you know, it's funny. The first time I did it, uh, First time, the first time that I had an Apple executive on the show was Phil Schiller. Uh, forget what year, twenty fourteen, maybe. I, I'm not good with years anymore. Have you noticed that as you get older? Like, it used to be like I knew exactly like you know that happened in nineteen ninety two. This happened in nineteen ninety six. Now it's like I don't know. It's the last five or six years. <laughs> yeah, all- last last night I figured out the last time I played Dungeons and Dragons was thirty eight years ago, and then it just made me sad. Right, but it's when when. when it had happened at an age where you could pin exactly how old you were, right? You yep. were like, yep. I was in 11th grade, you know? Yeah. I, it came together surprisingly last minute, uh, at least by the standards of making something like that happen, uh, where I had the venue secured, I had mezzanine, and we'd been there for a few years. I think I'd had the, the year before I had the entire ATP triumvirate on stage. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking who, who to have this year, you know? Um, and I, you know, I had it, I've always, always had it in the back of my head that wouldn't it be neat to, to get somebody like Phil Schiller? Uh, seems like he'd be good. I, I'm not a shy person, but I'm also, uh, reserved in certain ways. And so the idea of asking something like that is very, I don't like to ask for anything. I don't, I don't like to ask permission because I don't want to be told no. Right. And so, I mean, that's partly why I wanted to work for myself rather than work for another publication. I don't want to ask, can I do the, can I write a feature about blank? I just want to write it. But I thought, you know what? I, I don't know. I don't know what got in me. I, it's, you know, I thought, you know what? I'll ask Dowling. So I emailed Steve Dowling and said, Hey, you know, it was like maybe like a week and a half before WWDC, <laughs> like 10 days before WWDC. I said, Hey, here's something I've been thinking about. You tell me, maybe it's a crazy idea. Um, uh, I do this live show every year at WWDC. Uh, What do you think about uh, having Phil Schiller as my guest this year? Um, You know, it would take about an hour. uh, You know, you know, the audience, you know, and I sent him like a link to like the last year's show on Vimeo. Uh, And he emailed back like an hour later. And I spent that hour like, oh, my God, what the hell did I just do? Uh, (laughs) He wrote and he just sent me an email and he said, that's not a crazy idea at all. Let's talk tomorrow. And, you know, and he, you know, and the next day we talked on the phone and he said, yeah, I talked to Phil. He thinks it's a great idea. Let's do it. You know, what do you need from us? And, uh, you know, it couldn't have been easier from there. It couldn't have been easier. Uh, I was like, geez, maybe I should ask for more. (laughs) Like like it really is a sort of, you know, and here I am, you know, I I don't know. I was already 41 years old. You know, it's like, I should have learned some lessons like that in life, but it, you know, it, 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 so many, so much, the older I get, the more I find more and more that some of the best advice in life are the most common bits of advice you ever hear. Like it doesn't hurt to ask is actually fantastic advice, but it's, it, I mean this sincerely. So it, you're right. It, it you know, I, I, I'm not going to deny it. It's a big part of the WWDC week, right? People can't wait to get these tickets. They sell out in a minute. It is a fantastic venue now in, in San Jose. Uh, the videos are of it are super popular. People like it, and uh, honest to God, it almost didn't happen. Like there's there is a, a, an alternate universe uh, where you know a butterfly flapping its wings in China in 2013 leads to me in 2014 not quite having the nerve to ask to see if Phil Schiller would want to do the show. Uh, there's some universe where that you know it was uh, me and John Moltz up there that that year. Well, you know what? I'll tell you what I uh, I admire about you on that is I feel like 
in some ways, every year I see you go get up on stage with some Apple executive, and I feel like putting myself in your shoes, it feels like it could be a no-win situation. It's like if you aren't a, if you're too aggressive with them, they just won't answer questions and they'll never come back and we won't get any information out of them. If you're too soft with them, everybody will say there's Gruber being an Apple fanboy, you know. Uh but it seems like every year you manage to kind of walk the line and get them to say things that I don't think they intended to say. <laughs> uh but also, you know, get them to come back the next year. Part of it is having the right the right people like everybody, you know, the thing I get over and over and over again is wouldn't it be great if you get Tim cook? I'm not going to say I would, I wouldn't say no. Um, but I think that would be, I think that would be really tough because I feel like he is really, really hard to knock off message. I I've never seen him knocked off message. I mean, he's really good <laughs> at his thing. He is really good at it. And it's one of those funny things where, you know, I think to be a successful CEO, of a company like Apple. Like, I don't know, like, I have no idea who the CEO of Exxon Mobil is these days or what, what he or she does, what they're like personality wise. It seems to me from what I've observed that most of the CEOs of big public com corporations are complete dullards in their, at least publicly. I mean, they must have tremendous political skill to rise to the top of a company, but they don't seem like interesting people at all. At least from what I can see, it just seems incredibly dull. But then on the, you know, but maybe it's like, because I'm not into oil and gas. I don't know. Maybe if I was in oil, I wrote a blog about, about the energy industry. I think it's fascinating. But I, I do think it's interesting that uh, Tim Cook is really good at things that aren't really related to the, the actual job of being CEO. I mean, Steve Jobs certainly was. Uh, like the fact that Steve Jobs was a fabulous showman. And, and was truly the best there ever was at getting up in front of a bunch of people and making product announcements. He would have been a great CEO, even if that, he hadn't had that skill. I mean, it certainly helped. It didn't hurt, but you know, it wasn't really necessary. Uh, I, the fact that Tim Cook is so good at that messaging isn't really part of being CEO, but it makes him, it, he, it means that he can be the company spokesperson Right. Like there's a, I guess that's what I'm trying to say is there's certainly a lot of companies where, where, when the company has something to do and it has, somebody has to speak to the press, it may not be the CEO who does it. It might be somebody else because they're better at staying on message. But the fact that he's always on message makes me worry that I, 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 I would lose that conversational aspect that I've had with, with, you know, the, the guests who have been on the show. I think with, with Tim Cook, that even extends to what he shares personally. Like I've seen Phil Schiller and Craig and all these other guys on stage with you. And I feel like I know them as a person a little bit better having listened to them talk with you for a while, right? Like anecdotes or just their view on things. But anytime you see Cook talk about his personal life or, you know, things, not necessarily Apple, but Apple adjacent, even that feels like it's very tightly done in a way that you wouldn't have the warmth you have with some of these other executives, I don't think. I, who knows? Maybe it would come up. Maybe it would play very differently, right? I, I don't know. Maybe, it would, you know, but I think if if it was the Tim Cook that you see on CNBC, I think that's not a great episode of the talk show. It, it might be. I don't know. But it's, I don't know. So the other, the other guest that people often say, wouldn't it be great if it would be Johnny Ive? Uh, and in some ways, it would be fantastic. Uh, and, and if, for example, I was given the option, if they said, you, you know, you could have Tim Cook or Johnny Ive, but you can't get can't do both at the same time. I would probably pick Johnny Ive. And just because I feel like I'd, I'd be more comfortable talking about products and design. Um, but they both are good. But, but Johnny Ive famously doesn't really like being on stage. I mean, he's done it. I've seen him at like the New Yorker festival, um, you know, but he's, he's guarded and reserved in a way that, you know, Phil Schiller and Craig Federighi aren't, right? I mean, Federighi's a goof almost, you know, he came running out the one time, you know, like Johnny Ives not going to run on stage. I'll tell you, my favorite guest at those live shows is always Federighi, because not only is he just kind of fun and yeah. and one of us, he, he, t he always says more than he wanted to. <laughs> he's excited about the stuff, you know, he's enthusiastic about it and it comes out. And Schiller is interesting. Schiller is the best at it. It's almost unbelievable that he, it, it, you, if you look for like Phil Schiller, you know, doing something like that, it's like he's 
he hasn't done it, but he is, you, you would think that he's been on like the tonight show multiple times. You know, he is so utterly at ease and seems like, you know, one of those guests who's on TV talk shows a couple times a year, every year. Right. It, it it's uncanny how good he is at it. Um, whereas, but, but he's also, while he seems like he's totally natural, he, he is, again, can't really be knocked off message, even if the message is different than when he's delivering a keynote, whereas Craig is, is a little bit more of a freewheeler. You think maybe after reporting to Steve Jobs for all those years, nobody can scare you? <laughs> you know? I wonder. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, and, you know, if I, 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 and again, this stuff usually comes together towards the, the last minute, you know, like, so last year, uh, Mike Rockwell, who does uh, machine learning and AI at Apple, was was the guest with Craig, um, and it, it was informed by the fact that it was that was a big part of what they were announcing at WWDC. But I didn't find out about it till you know like the week before. Uh, you know, they're like, "What do you think about this?" And like I said, to, said to my contact in Apple PR, I was like, "I would love to talk to him. It's fascinating." And I know you're not going to answer this, but I was like. I would especially like it if there's a lot of machine learning announcements coming in the keynote because <laughs> it. I'm sure I'll be able to come up with a lot of questions in the next day. Uh, and if not, maybe not so much, <laughs> you know, so it was sort of, I mean, they did not honestly, and it, dealing with Apple PR, like you can't knock them again. They're old consummate pros, like no, no smiley face, no, no winkies or anything like that in iMessage. It was, you know, but just by saying that they, they thought Mike, Mike Rockwell would be a good guest, <laughs> it, it was as close as they come to saying, here's something that's coming in the, the keynote next week. I want to talk about WBC for a second, not necessarily the event itself, but sort of the community around it. So there are people like me, this will be my, I don't know, sixth or seventh time coming out, but I've never attended the conference. I'm not a developer. I would enjoy going to the keynote and stuff, but there a lot of it would be lost on me, so I'm not going to enter the lottery. But these live shows like yours on Wednesday and ATP does theirs, we do ours at Relay, uh, and and all the sort of parallel conferences have really created sort of a destination where if you're an Apple nerd and you can get to San Jose and take a week off work, there's lots to do. Uh, and I just wonder, as someone who's been doing it for, uh, been kind of in this world for a long time, do you think that's changed over time? Do you think that Apple could do more to to cultivate that? Like, how do you? How, what's your sense when looking at WBC as a sort of event on the Apple nerds calendar? Jason Snell wrote the the best article about that a couple of years ago. It's sort of like an evergreen article, just that it's become the you know the central event on the Apple world calendar. And it's you know it's very different than it used to be um, because it, in the old days we had MacWorld Expo which was sort of filled that role. Uh, and if you go back even earlier, uh, there were two Macworld Expos. I forget when the one in New York stopped being a thing, but I, I, I think, I don't even, I, th I think that's actually predates Daring Fireball. Um, but in that era, I would go to the one in New York because it's a short train ride from Philly. Uh, you know, I forget when I first went to Macworld Expo in San Francisco, but it was a couple of years into Daring Fireball. Um, it, but, and, and you know, the Macworld Expo, you, anybody could get an Expo pass. I think it was like 25 bucks or something like that. So you just get there and walk around the show floor. Uh, and, you know, there a bunch of people would come from around the country and you'd see people in the, in the racket. Um, but there weren't really ancillary events either, right? Like you'd go out to dinner with people, but it's like everything was really just the, the conference and Expo, right? And then Apple's stuff was always... So it's just Apple, right? And, and you know, it's, it is, to me, it's a, just a, a very clear indication of the difference between the Steve Jobs era and the Tim Cook era at Apple. Like, uh, Apple may well have moved WWDC to San Jose if Steve Jobs were still around, but they, they wouldn't be hosting and, and getting space for all these community events. Like, that's something that Apple, I, it's, you know, definitely a change that they're a little bit more... A little bit less insular. I, I don't know how to put it. Uh, 
you know, they've really embraced this though, you know, like with the layers conference that Jesse Char runs, uh, you know, coincident with, with the, uh, WWDC, which is just such a great idea to have a design focused conference next to this big developer conference. Cause you know, certainly a big part of the very same community that developers are a part of is the And, and even designers. AltConf, which is a, a developer conference that yep. runs parallel and usually next door. Right. Um, right. however I would say, you yeah. know, having attended both, um, I think Macworld scratched an itch that WWDC still doesn't for users, you know, for you know, our listeners, yeah. the Mac power users. Yeah. A lot of times I get yeah. here from listeners and say, should I go? And I, I don't really know that there's a reason to go if you just like to use Apple stuff. The shame of it is how expensive it is. It is so unbelievably expensive. It's and and moving it to San Jose hasn't helped at all. If anything, uh, somebody was for a Slack that I'm on. We were looking at at uh, hotels for the best guess for when WWDC is going to be this year. I mean, and there's two the first two weeks of June. It's certainly going to be one of them. And the hotel rates are higher than ever. Now, part of that is probably because Apple has a block at all the downtown hotels. They've already, you know, it, it's already gotten so messed up though. It is the hotel situation is it is is unbelievable. I mean, but you're looking at it's like 350 bucks a night for like a three and a half star hotel. It's crazy. I mean, you go to Disney for less than that. I am. Um, I'm going to do Airbnb this year because I was looking. It's like the hotels have figured it out. Like last year was the last year you could get a decent price this year. Yeah, it's like it's like you could buy a MacBook Pro or stay there for five days, you know, one or the other. Yeah, that's definitely a huge downside. And one that I hear from people like, hey, we'd like to come come out but you know it's it's the cost is just prohibitive and uh, you know there's nothing to do about that i guess i mean apple can't i, I guess can't go around to these hotels and be like hey you got to charge less for people you know if they come with a with a macbook pro you got to charge them less but it sure is a shame that it, it it knocks so many people out where you know macworld and these other events that used to be around you know san francisco's expensive but maybe it was uh, a little bit less than what san jose's become because in san jose they're just so fewer options to stay places and flights are harder and, and all that stuff. I forget which year it was, but it might've been after the financial collapse of 2008. Sounds about right. Um, it was when the intercontinental in San Francisco went up right next to Moscone and it's a really nice hotel. Um, and like the first year it was like me and a bunch of friends were, uh, I forget what we were using hot wire. I don't know. Or hot, hot, one of those sites where you can get discount hotels, but it didn't tell you the name of the hotel. You have to like, you had to book it before they would tell you what it was, but you could search for like, I want a place that's a uh, half a mile away from Moscone and has a pool and has a, a gym and has this and that. And, and then there's these sites where you can go to and it, it and it'll say like, if it says it's a four star hotel with a pool and with this, and it's not dog friendly, then it's the intercontinental. Like you can backwards engineer it. Right. Right. And we figured out that we could get rooms at the intercontinental during WWDC for like, I swear to God, like it was like $118 a night. And this is a brand new four star over oh, like, this can't be true. And like, I think it was my friend, Paul Cafasta said, Rogan Meepo. He's like, well, I'm pulling the trigger on it. <laughs> and he did it. And he was like, it's the intercon. And so we all booked and it was like a whole week there. It was like the, <laughs> at a really nice hotel, literally connected to Moscone physically. So, so super convenient. And it was like $118 a night. And now it's like $400 a night to stay at like stupid Marriott or something. Or you could be like David, who used to stay at, where did you used to stay? The... It was like communal hall bathrooms and stuff. Oh yeah, <laughs> in San, the uh, there was one that right next door to Masconi. I forget the name of it. Is it the Mosser is it the Mosser. The Mosser, the Mosser. Yeah. Yes, where, <laughs> yeah. where you had to share yeah. a bathroom, yeah. and then like your <laughs> sink was next to the bed. But you know, <laughs> I always had this theory that I um I'm one of these types. If you give me a nice hotel room, I will. I am an introvert, and I will just stay in the hotel room. I never had that problem when I stayed at the Mosser. <laughs> That was very social those years. <laughs> Get me out of here. <laughs> no. So, yeah, I agree, though, that, that the, you know, and I, the conference business is tough. It really is tough business. And, you know, but it culturally or socially, there's nothing on the calendar that fits the role that Macworld Expo did, uh, just in terms of being a, a reason for people from around the country to get together. Yeah, I, I hate that I missed it. I kind of came into this at the tail end of it. Uh, this is where David and I met was actually at a Macworld, you know. And I, I look back at them, and you know, to the thing that I didn't attend, but I, I can see how people would miss that, and how WBC just can't quite offer it. It offers it if you can afford it, or if it's your job, but it's not nearly as accessible. 
No, and it's, you know, you know, it is what it is. It's better than nothing, and it's great that Apple's, you know, so it's better in some ways, but it's it doesn't fill, the, you know, doesn't fill the void in others. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by our friends at Luna Display, the only hardware solution that turns your iPad into a wireless display for your Mac. Use promo code POWER, P-O-W-E-R, at checkout for 10% off. Have you ever looked at your iPad and wished you could use it as a second display for your Mac? Luna Display lets you do just that. And it makes sense, right? Your iPad already has a gorgeous display, and you can always use some extra space when you're working on your Mac. Luna Display provides crystal clear image quality, reliable performance, and wireless flexibility. You just pop a little piece of hardware into your Mac and you're good to go. And if you don't have access to a Wi-Fi connection, no worries. You can just connect with USB. When using Luna Display, you can set up your workspace anywhere. So you can be productive at the office, in the studio, or on the go. You get more screen real estate without the expense of buying a new screen. Luna also acts as a complete extension to your Mac. It's going to support your external keyboard as well as your Apple Pencil and touch interactions. So you can interact with your Mac with a swipe of the finger. There are several ways I use my Luna display, but my favorite right now is as an external display to my iMac as we're sitting here recording the Mac Power users. I've got all the recording gizmos going off on my Luna display, so my beautiful iPad screen has all of that information just to my left, and I can focus on the outline and the rest of the stuff that we need to do to make the show. The Luna display acts as a great second monitor for my Mac, and it's all wireless. Listeners of Mac Power Users can get an exclusive 10% discount on Luna Display. Just go to lunadisplay.com and enter the promo code POWER at checkout. That's lunadisplay.com and promo code POWER at checkout. Our thanks to Luna Display for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. John, I have a question for you on something. Even though it's been many years since you've been here, I think you're still using the same Mac. What, what Mac are you using these days? Uh, it's a 2014. I'm not 90% sure. 2014 13-inch MacBook Pro. Maxed out. 16 gigs of RAM and I think a one terabyte. Yeah, it's got to be a one terabyte SSD. So what, four years, four and a half years? Yeah, it was, I think it was probably kind of new the last time you were on, but uh, you haven't you haven't felt the need to replace it yet. No, uh, and it's funny, I've said this on my show, but it's, you know, I, my son got the same exact model uh, four years ago, and he's in seventh, no, ninth grade, geez. <laughs> he's in ninth grade, he's 14. Uh, his, his was in much rougher shape than mine. And yeah, I'm had sure. To be, had to be replaced recently by a. Yeah, we got him the new MacBook Air. Uh, I've thought about it, but it, honestly, the keyboard thing keeps me from it. And I, you know, I, I, I mean, it's a privilege. It is truly a remarkable privilege. And I try to keep that perspective in mind when I do reviews of Apple products. Um, that being able to review them for. F- free you know apple gives me a new macbook pro and i can use it for six weeks at full time and then send it back to them you know and decide now you know <laughs> what a great way to decide whether you want to buy the new thing right it's a lot a lot better than going to the apple store for a few minutes <laughs> uh, definitely so the you know last summer i got the uh, I, had, I used the 15 inch macbook pro the new one from that just came out last summer for literally like six weeks full time including a lot of travel um and I used to use a 15 inch years ago uh, and went smaller because I used, I was using them less. Um, and I really did like it. It's really a nice machine and the keyboard, I got used to it. Uh, and I like the new trackpad. I love like my, my, this MacBook pro that I have here, the one thing that really seems old on it is the trackpad because it's not the magic one. It actually physically clicks like, <laughs> which now seems ridiculous. Um, uh, but it wasn't enough. It was like, man, it, and you know, and then I went back to this machine because that's always the test. That's and that's the part that's a real privilege is being able to like a normal person has to decide, all right, am I going to get a new MacBook Pro or what? And if you get it, then they use it. Right. But being able to review it for a month and then go back to my other machine, my older machine really gives you a sense of, hmm, should I buy the new one? Uh, and I went back to this and I was like, you know what? I, I like the keyboard better it's still fast enough. Nothing. I, I mean, I've long passed the time when, when I'm really bound by the CPU, uh, for anything that I do. 
uh, you know, so really I probably more than anything, it's the keyboard that keeps me on it because I just like this keyboard better. And, you know, I've always had it in my head. I, I, I've said this before, like I'll get a new iPhone every year. Cause you just get a new iPhone and you restore from backup and there's all your stuff. I, it, it takes me less time now to set up a new Mac. Like, and you know, I, I had this revelation where I was avoiding the, uh, the migration assistant for years. Uh, cause I had a bad, I had bad experiences with it, but they were literally back in like 1998, you know, it was a, yeah. a very different, different time. Maybe they've worked on it. Right. But I was like, I'd use the, you know, and, and I'd wind up using it and then not, you know, it, it would leave some stuff half installed or whatever. And I'd have to, I would be like, you know what, I'm just going to wipe the hard drive, reinstall the Mac and do this all by hand. Um, migration assistant has gotten really good. And so, you know, as like a tip to throw, toss out there to listeners, I'll bet listeners of this show are, are, you know, have long memories like me. Next time you get a new Mac, try the migration assistant. It is kind of amazing. And it even moves stuff over that you wouldn't think it would like, uh, like a bunch of Perl modules I have installed through the command line and, and stuff like that, or homebrew stuff. It, it was amazing to me, some of that stuff that I, I was like, there's no way it's going to get stuff out of user slash local bin, but it did. Uh, it was, it's really great. And then after I ranted about it on my show, somebody wrote to me from Apple and they're like, Oh my God, dude, you're, you have been missing out. And they were, I think they even told me who it was, but they're, you know, like, uh, uh, at some point in the two thousands, like some really, really crackerjack engineers at Apple, like just like two or three people like took over it and like, you know, it's like everything you want Apple software to be. It's like two, two or three super, superstars with really high standards. The the migration just to, to back up a second really is incredible. I actually ran it this morning. My wife is getting a new MacBook Air. She's on like a 2013 iMac. So I thought it was maybe time, and it did something I didn't, I wasn't even aware it did. Where the iMac was running 10.14.2, and the Air came with I guess dot one out of the box, and before it migrated, it said, "Hey, you're you know." other system is has newer software let me pause this and it downloaded the update and installed 10.14.2 and then picked the migration up again it was like it is something that used to be if that was going to be a problem you'd have to install it and then you know wipe it or like do a migration after the fact it just handled it in line it was really impressive did you connect them by USB-C or did you um, just do it over wi-fi I did Thunderbolt. Uh, her iMac had Thunderbolt, so I had the you know Thunderbolt three to two adapter or whatever, and it's you know, it was speedy. But the, I hadn't come across the upgrade in place deal. It was pretty nifty. I did it over Wi Fi, and it was <laughs> I was like, this is stupid. But I, I was so pessimistic that it was going to be good at all. I was like, ah, I'll do it on Wi Fi. But I bet this will take <laughs> seventy two hours, and I'll have to cancel it. You know, and instead yeah. it was fast. It was it, it was like I went away and I came back. I thought it crashed. I was like, ah, oh, see, I was right. It crashed. Instead, it was just done. Yeah, I think it does like du- direct, like direct peer to peer stuff now. I mean, it's it's come yeah. a long way. Yeah, yeah, like that direct peer to peer stuff is sh- can be shockingly fast over over Wi Fi. Yeah, the, the thing for me is like I update a Mac about every four years. I'll get a new one and. Uh, for me, it's not that I'm afraid of uh, these technologies as much as I just kind of want a fresh start. You know, I've got because I test a lot of different software and I do a bunch of wacky things with my computer. Yeah, it feels good to just like have a clean start. But I, I, it's probably dumb to do that because I spend so much time putting Apple scripts back together and it's just like the whole. Yeah, I don't know how many hours I lose. And 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 it's like little gotchas that show up for like an, a year afterward, you know. You go to reach or something and it's not there. It's like, oh, yeah, I didn't set that up yet. Yeah, And I think part of it, too, for me is that back in the old days, I would have more system extension type things. Uh, and the design of Mac OS X has gotten to the point now where you there aren't really sketchy ways to install stuff anymore, right? Like, what were those, you know, like the hacksies from Unsanity and, and remember their symbol plugins? Remember that there was like a thing, there was like some kind of uh, S-I-M-B-L plug-in thing that could be, it was really just, it was literally, it was the way that they worked was sort of like an exploit. It was like, you'd, you'd install this thing that was supposed to be for like accessibility, but instead it would like patch every single Cocoa app to add like a, a, a keyboard shortcut for X, Y, and Z or something. Uh, it was really sort of like, you know, the same t- taking advantage of it in a way that like software gets exploited uh, by, you know, malware. Those things are gone. Like I don't, and I, 
nobody uses stuff like that anymore. There's, there's officially sanctioned ways to do it. And so I even, you know, I just find there's less of a reason to get that clean start. Like it used to be like, yeah, you should do a clean start and then only start adding those extensions back as you find that you really need them. And it was a good way to sort of break yourself of stuff that you'd forgotten you'd even installed. But that might be sort of gumming up the works behind the scenes. Sometimes I, I stop and think about all the time I spent, like, changing the icons on all of my apps and just, like, stupid things I did in the years past on my Mac. <laughs> and I really wish I had those hours back. Well, I think it's easier to run a, a, a stock system now, right? It, Mac OS comes with so many things you used to have to add on yeah. that has now come in the box. It's, it's almost easier to kind of get by on just what comes with it. Now, the MacBook Pro is not your main system. You have a Retina iMac as well, don't you? I do, and I love it. Um, I have, It's the original Retina 5K, so whatever year. Probably around the same year. I think it was 2013. Yeah, 14 or 15, 20, somewhere in there. Yeah, 2014. It's the one before they came out with the high, high deep, not high DPI, the uh, extended the color. Wide color. Yeah, wide color. Yeah. yeah. Uh, still running fantastic, as good as new. Um, I guess you're not taking that up and down the stairs to record podcasts with them. No, no, that stays in the <laughs> office. But uh, <laughs> I, it's, it's. I don't want to get too into it, but because uh, I'm not looking for any kind of pity or sympathy, and I'll be fine. But my eyesight is such that I the di- the viewing distance for me on a 5K iMac is such that I I have trouble reading. And I could blow up the screen, but I, I'm reluctant. I'm too stubborn to do that. Um, whereas laptop distance is much better for me. There's a very narrow range where I, I can read comfortably. So I have I would say at this point, like 95% of the time is on the MacBook. That's interesting. I, I would assume that you worked on the Mac, the iMac a lot, but yeah, yeah. I would, I would if, I would if yeah. my vision were fine. And, you know, it could be fine again, but... Uh, so this is the old man problems corner of Mac power users. I, yes. I, when I, I remember when I was a young man and I made fun of everyone that would increase the point size on their computers. Yeah. Not, not, I don't do that anymore. I don't make fun of them. I caught myself doing that in my text editor for the first time about two years ago. I was like, oh, oh, here, here it is. Now, now it's beginning. <laughs> Slippery slope, baby. <laughs> I remember I was in college. And I had an intern summer internship, uh, you know, it was like my first one. So it was, you know, real low. I mean, I was just basically just a computer monkey installing stuff. Uh, and the boss, it was at the General Services Administration, at the branch of the federal government that does all of their procurement. They have a big office here in Philadelphia. Uh, and working for the General Services Administration <laughs> is exactly what you think it is. It just couldn't be more, ex- you know, whatever you're imagining the office look like, that's exactly it. And like the the district manager, I mean, I say the boss, but it was like the boss that I dealt with. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like 17 levels of hierarchy, you know. Um, but the boss got a 17 inch monitor, which in like 1992 or three, it would have been. Uh, see what I mean there, David? It's yeah. like I know exactly which year it had to be. Uh, was it maybe even a 19 inch monitor? I don't know what it was, but it was it was at an era when a 15 inch monitor yeah. was expensive and big. Yeah. And he got a 17 inch monitor and he, it really looked great. I thought I was like, man, this is a nice monitor. It was like a view Sonic or something. And it was like, man, this is nice. Uh, but he was very word guy came to me like, like he, you know, we were separated enough that he wouldn't come to me to complain. Word would come to me that he was, he was very dissatisfied with the monitor. Uh, it's too small. And I thought, Oh my God, this, uh, you can't even get a bigger monitor than that. I, I was like, I like looking, it's like, yeah, I guess somebody has like a 19 inch or whatever, but it turned out what he wanted was everything to be big. He wanted it running at 640 by 480. And once I set that in windows, he was like, this is great. I love it. <laughs> and I thought, what a waste. I just remember walking right. out. I was like, he's got this gorgeous monitor. I was like, man, I, and it, and it, it could be driven, you know, I forget what it supported, but it, tiny, tiny type. It could, could drive. Uh, and what he wanted was 640 by 480, just everything big. And now, like you said, David, like, I don't laugh at that anymore. I cry. I don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's given me, like, I don't want pity. I mean, my eyesight situation is, it's complicated though. It is it both the, both of my eyes have problems, but, and they're totally different problems. <laughs> so it really gets to be, there's a, a mismatch between, you know, with, with vision being very different in both eyes, it's, it's interesting. Um, but it's, in it some ways it's, uh, it is, it's kind of, it, 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 it's a good problem to have because I still can see 
like 2020, you know, it's just as a sort of screwed up 2020. And it gives you an appreciation for what somebody with a really significant vision problem would has to deal with. Like, I think I've always had a, a, a an interest in accessibility, but actually needing a bit of the accessibility features really gives you an appreciation for how amazingly well Apple, Apple handles that stuff. Like I, one of my, I, I, I would like to hug them. I would like to take the entire team out to dinner at my expense to get the iOS people who, who built the dynamic text feature. Um, because not only is it useful, I only, I'm only up one click on my iPhone, like from the default. Um, but there were times like my, the other thing with my vision, and I don't want to bore you with it, but it's, it's, it's in flux as well. Uh, like I had a retina problem a couple of years ago and had a surgery and it was really, really bad after surgery. And then it slowly improved uh, and it's, it continues to improve years later. Um, but now my right eye has problems. Uh, and I, you know, and it's, it's funny too, cause I have the presbyopia, you know, which is what you need reading glasses yeah. for when you hit your mid forties. But for reasons I don't understand, and my eye doctor doesn't understand, like for about a year, I I needed reading glasses to read while I had my contact lenses in. Absolutely, I needed. I forget what what number they're at, but they're not super strong. But I absolutely needed them, and absolutely needed them to read like a, a menu in a restaurant. I, so I carried reading glasses with me wherever I went. And somehow, about three months ago, I stopped needing reading glasses, but only if the screen is exactly about twelve inches in front of me. You know, there's like this certain narrow range, but now I don't need reading glasses. It doesn't even make any sense to me. The way that I, what I'm trying to get at is I, I want to celebrate the fact that I, not just that iOS has this feature that lets you bump the text size up, but when you do it, everything still looks right. It, it doesn't, it's not like, oh, you're, you have bad eyes, so we'll let you make the text bigger, but everything's going to look ugly. Yeah, it's not like the guy back at the GSA. No, it is. Well, even then, you know, running it at 644 by 40, it didn't look wrong, but it did kind of look silly. But, you know, and I have, you know, the other thing, too, is once you have it's like when you have a baby and, and all of a sudden you notice that, oh, my God, there's babies everywhere. Right. Like I never noticed this all over the city. There's people pushing babies around and baby strollers. You know, I'm not alone, <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden you need uh you need reading glasses or you start to need reading glasses. And all of a sudden you realize there's all sorts of other people, you know, in their forties and older who need reading glasses all the time. Like I never noticed this, this restaurant is full of people who can't read the menu. And it really, really, it, it, it's just so great. The support that iOS has for it. And I'll tell you what, Android is a, a terrible for, for the same thing. Like the text option size on, on a pixel three are just terrible compared to the iPhone. You know, I think even the Mac has room to catch up to iOS. You know, iOS, it's, it feels like a real focus. And maybe yeah. because it's newer, they've been able to build it in as they go. But I, I know, like in Mac OS, there's still corners of stuff. You turn some accessibility options on and it's just broken or doesn't act the way you expect it to. I wish they would make more progress on that front. Yeah, I kind of agree with that, too. Yeah. And it's just and the fact that there's just one setting and just bump the slider up and it affects the text everywhere is so great. And it, I think it's also the case that there's more Mac software that sort of wings it on tech size, as opposed to having like this one system wide, you know, sure. here's how big I want my text to be. Well, even like option. Apple notes up until very recently, you couldn't change the text size on, which made it unusable for some people. Right. Right. The, the, the accessibility uh, functions on iPhone and iPad also have that great magnifier tool for people that are having trouble uh, reading like mm -hmm. a restaurant menu that if you don't have your glasses with you, that can save your bacon. Yeah. For people who don't know, you, you can set it in accessibility so that like a triple click of the power button just instantly turns your phone into a magnifying glass. Wait, now, you are uh, not really an iPad guy. Um, you're more, you've said earlier in the show that you feel like it's sometimes it's like working with gloves yeah. on. Um, mittens. The, um, Worse than gloves. Mittens, that's right. <laughs> what, where, where does the iPad fit in your life? I mean, do you have anything you use it for or is it something? Reading. Uh, and again, it, it it gets to the vision situation I have where there's this very, you know, somewhere around 12 inches or so right in front of my eyes is where I need something to be to read it clearly. And so I don't need to bump the text size up at all, but I, I need to have it at this, you know, very, very narrow range. And the iPad is fantastic for that because it's super lightweight and it's super easy to hold exactly where I need it to be to see. So... I do I do more reading on the iPad than I ever have before, simply because it, it 
it's almost like an accessibility thing. Um, but then because I'm doing a reading there, if I want to link to something right away, it just feels it, it, uh, it, 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 usually I just walk, I just put it down and, or I'll bookmark it to pinboard and go to then walk to another room, go on my MacBook and finish linking to it to daring fireball from there. Just because it's so, I just feel so hamstrung on iOS. Have you ever played with like some of the extensions or um, like the Siri shortcut ability to save web pages and things like that? Or is it, you're just back on the Mac? No, I don't, you know what, I guess, I guess what I do too, is I, I do love the continuity features, you know, so I'll just walk over to the Mac and then just bring it's up the open. sharing sheet and, and shoot it over to my Mac. Uh, so I do use it a lot and I really do like this iPad, but I still, I, I, there's so many little ways that I just feel hamstrung compared to the Mac. Now, if you were, um, cause you think about Apple a lot and it's, you know, it's pretty clear from a lot of people that you know, the iPad is doing great with hardware, but could use some help with software where if you were in charge, what, you know, what do you think they need to work on first for iPad to make it, you know, to get those mittens off your hands? I, th I really think that it needs it to be more of an iPad OS. I feel, you know, I can see why they did it this way. And I, you know, you know, it, it a lot, I always say it, a lot of times if it, you listen to Apple. Yes, they are very calculating. They're very good at, at uh, marketing. But if you just listen to them, there's a very high likelihood that what they're saying is is the truth. And you go back to Steve Jobs' introduction of the original iPad and more or less saying, look, you've got your phone. It's with you everywhere. And it's great for X, Y, and Z. You got your MacBook, which is uh, less portable than a phone, um, a different form factor, but good at you know, A, B, and C, which are very different things. Is there room in between them for a device, you know, that has some of the things of the phone and some of the features like a bigger screen of the Mac? Uh, we think there is, you know, and software wise though, they had to make a choice, right? They, you know, either could make a touchscreen version of Mac OS or make it into, or, or, use the iPad, you know, at the time it wasn't even called iOS, right? It was like iPhone OS. Yeah. Yeah. And they came up with the name after the iPad came up. Um, I, I think that was the right decision. I think it was right to make it a big iPhone rather than a touchscreen Mac. Um, but as the years go by, I think it suffered, it has suffered tremendously by being the second favored platform for the same OS. Like it's in too many ways for 2018, it really still is just a big iphone right I, I, that's the like the initial reaction to ipad was from the tech some tech people was uh, it's just a big I, I, iphone what they wanted was the touchscreen tablet mac right because then there's you know it's way more nerdy right it's more of a power user tool but that phrase it's just a big iphone actually helped sell the iPad. Like it's, you know, nerds were saying it to deride it, but it was actually like when normal people heard, Oh, I can get a, a big 10 inch iPhone. Yes. <laughs> that would be great. I love my yeah. iPhone. I, you know, and, and there's a significant people, number of people who that's all they still yeah, want. Absolutely. You know? And so that I'm not saying it would be easy. I, you know, nothing's easy, you know, especially developing, you know, powerful uh, operating systems, you know, but that's what Apple does, right? It's not easy to create, Mac OS and keep it going and have it still be relevant and useful in 2018. But, you know, that's Apple's business. But I really feel like the iPad at a fundamental level really should be a third computing platform. I mean, it could be derived from iOS. I mean, it probably surely always will be, but it, it should be almost more like the way Apple TV is technically iOS, you know, like if you got in there and, and, and hook up your Apple TV, if you're a developer writing uh, Apple TV apps and you're hooked up to Xcode, you can tell you're running a version of iOS, but it's, you know, it's clearly not the, the phone operating system running on your TV, right? I feel like the iPad needs, needs more of that sort of thing. And I feel like, I think Apple has been too reluctant to make to make it more Mac-like in certain ways. You know, there was that great post from the Codia developers that I, I linked to recently. It did, but more or less they wrote about how their Codia is a, a, a scripting app for the iPad. You can write uh, little games and, and lots of cool stuff using the Lua programming language. And they've, you know, they've 
spent two years trying to figure out how to get more features into it in a touch friendly way. And they were like, you know what, how about a menu bar? Right. And they, you know, had these two blog posts documenting how they built a, not something that it's not like a ripoff of the Mac. It's not like, Oh, you'd be confused and think it's a Mac menu bar on an iOS app. It's like, but the same basic idea of a menu bar, but in an iOS way. And I feel like Apple has been reluctant to do stuff like that out of a sort of, I can't help but think that it's just on general principle, right? That they want to keep the iPad simple and therefore avoid stuff like that. And that, you know, something like a menu bar is considered, you know, too fuddy duddy, you know, it's too, too technical. Most people never use the menu bar. They just click the buttons that are, you know, the, the most obvious features that are right there in the window. Uh, and that's fine. I think, you know, the iPad should still work that way, basically. But then something like the menu bar should be there for when you do have more to expose. Yeah, and I'd like that team to be putting stuff out every year. It's it's just, as someone who does use iPad a lot, I don't own a laptop. I use iPad for all my mobile stuff. It's It seems silly to have to wait two years for every major update that's going to give me more productivity tools. Yeah. So I, if I, if I had my way within Apple, I'd have more people, uh, good talented people full time on iPad OS and they can't, you know, make it so they can't be pulled off to work on the iPhone. Um, uh, and I would have a big list and I'd say, let's, you know, let's, let's think about this ourselves based on, you know, cause surely they're users of these products, but you know, and let's talk to other people in other fields and let's make a big list of stuff you can do on a Mac that you can't do on an iPad and stuff you can do easily on a Mac that's not as easy on an iPad, right? And let's start prioritizing these. And every year, let's shorten these lists. One, you know, you're obviously not going to do it all at once. There's never going to be like, I don't know. There's rumors that iOS 13 is going to have lots of iPad productivity features in the OS. I have no idea. I mean, it certainly would seem overdue. Because there wasn't much last year, um, I, I, even in an ideal world, if if WWDC comes this year and Federico passes out because he's so happy <laughs> with all of the <laughs> all of the iPad features they announced, right? The best case scenario for the most iPad focused year at Apple ever. They're not going to even in that scenario, which probably won't happen given the iPhones prominence. It's still going to be lots of iPhone stuff. But even if it's almost all iPad, they're not going to get that list knocked to zero in one year, right? It, even it's a, it, that's, and that's sort of what's frustrating that, that we are where we are in 2018, that the, it's already an eight-year-old platform. And so to get it where I think it really needs to be, even if they focus on it, it's five, six years before they're, you'd say, wow, I think that's really there. From your lips to Tim's ears. But I re that's really the way I think they should approach it, though, with you get a big whiteboard and just list the things that are only possible on the Mac or only easy on the Mac and then just start knocking them out. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's so much low hanging fruit there. I mean, the file management got better, but it's still not good enough. I mean, it has tag support, but it really doesn't. I mean, there's just just like even, you know, I, I've talked about this on the show before, but try and create a folder using your your ipad just just say you want to save a file from an email something everybody does all the time and create a folder let me know how you how you do with that well and there's also certain things that only apple can do when and primarily i'm thinking about like make things system-wide conventions right so like these Codia guys have written have made this great menu bar system for their app and you know it's the sort of thing i would encourage developers to work on but that doesn't solve the problem no matter how great it is it, that's just one or two apps from one indie developer, right? What we need, like it's, to me, what's crazy is um, there's there's really no standard way to close a document in iOS, right? It's like sometimes you go back, I guess that's the closest there is to going back. And a lot of iOS isn't really document-based, it's, you know, like library-based. So like you don't really close, well, you're in Apple Notes, you don't really close a note, you just go back and whatever you had left was saved. But sometimes if you are working in a file, you you know, the concept of opening and closing a document is important, right? And uh, even like a great app like uh, Panic's uh, file transfer app, what's it? Is it Transmit for iOS? 
But it, is Transmit on iOS? I think it is. It, it is, but they've they've said that it's over. So it, it runs as long as it runs, but they've, they've pulled future development from it. Or is it uh, the other one, their coding app? I forget they've which one They've got Coda as Coda. well, though. I think it's Coda I'm thinking of. So I will use Coda. I have Coda on my iPhone. And I, if I need to, there's certain things I do at Daring Fireball that are literally just me opening a file. And it's a text file, in Mark, of course, in Markdown. And I edit and save. Uh, and there, and there it is. Um, so there will be times when I need to do something like that from my phone or I want to do it from my phone. Cause it's all I have with me. And I, it, it's like, I use it like once or twice a year. And every time I do, I forget how the hell you close a document. <laughs> like I have the text file open. I made this change. How do I close this? Like there is no thing like the red button in a window, you know, that every single app uses. Like it's crazy that there's no convention for how you close a document. Like, and that's really the sort of thing that has to come from Apple. Right. And it feels like so much of that is like legacy baggage. Like, okay, apps didn't have documents, right? There wasn't even multitasking. We we got that added in weird ways. But the screens were so small that you didn't have room for things like window controls and now screens are bigger. And it just feels like so much of iOS is still tied to its history that they've got to break some of those links in the past to, to ever move forward. Yeah. I think, I mean, I don't know how, if, if he's, I don't I mean, he knows all sorts of stuff, but Stephen Trouton Smith seems to be, seems convinced that one of the things iOS 13 is going to introduce is um, something like Safari tabs, but system wide so that, you know, like a text editor would, would have a standard way and, and that, that the standard way would be tabs. Uh, I mean, that's a solution that could be great, but boy, it seems weird in 2018 that you don't have that. This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by Eero. With Eero, you can build a Wi-Fi system that is perfectly tailored to your home. Considering the high bandwidth world we now live in, you need a distributed system in your home to make sure you get the best speeds available in every room. And with Eero, you can install an enterprise-grade Wi-Fi system in your home in just a few minutes. It all starts with the second-generation Eero device. It has three 5 gigahertz radios, which allows for increased speed and range. And it sits flat on any surface and connects via Ethernet or wirelessly. Now, from there, you easily expand the coverage throughout your whole home by adding in some Aero beacons. These are small devices that plug directly into the wall, allowing you to reach every corner of your home. And Eero is now introducing Eero Plus. It's designed to provide simple, reliable security to help defend all the devices in your home from malware, phishing, and unsuitable content. Eero Plus can automatically tag sites that contain violent, illegal, or adult content, so you'll have powerful parental controls at your fingertips. It includes ad-blocking functionality to help improve load times for websites that are full of privacy-invading ad tracking. And it's also possible to have Eero Plus check the sites you visit against a database of millions of unknown threats to prevent you from visiting anything malicious. Eero Plus even includes subscriptions to 1Password for password management, malware bytes for antivirus solutions, and Encrypt.me for VPN service. I've been using Aero Plus for a while. I've got a bunch of kids in the house, and I really like knowing that they can't stumble into anything out on the internet that I deem unacceptable. It was really easy to set up in the Aero app, which is just, it's huge. <laughs> it's a huge win over these, these web portals you have to use for other systems. It's just a really nice iOS app to go in and change your settings. I've really had a great experience with Aero in my home now for several years. Never think about Wi-Fi again. Get $100 off the Eero base unit and two beacons package and one year of Eero Plus. Just go to Eero.com slash MPU at checkout and use the promo code MPU. That's Eero, E-E-R-O dot com slash MPU and the code MPU at checkout. Our thanks to Eero for their support of this show and Relay FM. So we've talked a, a lot about the the future of the iPad and, and maybe some places Apple could go, but you're primarily uh, a Mac guy. That's how I, how I identify. I think it's how a lot of our listeners identify. Where does the Mac fit into that story? If if the I, if iOS is going to become more powerful and the iPad become more of a general purpose computer, what ground does that leave? Uh, the Mac to stand on probably less less and less ground as the years go on, and I say this as, as you know a devoted Mac user. I, I without hesitation, if I were only allowed to use one Apple product, it would be a Mac. I would in, I it would, it would hurt me to give up my iPhone, but I would do it before I gave up a Mac. 
um, because it's, I use it for work and it's more, that's more important, right? I can, I could get by with a pixel as my phone far easier than I could using anything other than a Mac for my work. Um, people who don't really use the Mac as a Mac probably would be better off with a more powerful iPad instead. Right. And, and at where to draw that line, you know, I mean, it's literally the name of your show, but where, where you become a power Mac power user, uh, I mean, it's obviously nebulous and a little bit arbitrary where there are certainly people who I would consider to be quote unquote power users who maybe have never written a single line of scripting code in their life. Like it's, there's no simple definition, but I would say they're definitely a power user. If you know the limits of the built-in command space thing, what's that called? Spotlight. I mean, I don't, it, you know, but people who listen to this show are all using Alfred or uh, uh, launch bar, launch bar. Yeah, I couldn't believe launch bar is the one I couldn't think of, and that's the one I use. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if, if you do stuff like that, the Mac is still clearly going to be the place for you to to go. But if you're not using stuff like that, you probably would be better on an iPad, right? I just feel like where the Mac, the territory of the Mac has a still has a, a long future ahead of it is that power user market. But if you really just use your Mac to, to open up Safari full screen and and use iMessages, uh, and you just want, you know, you, what you probably would be better off with is, uh, an iPad in a laptop form factor. Yeah. I mean, as much as I like my iPad and I, I have gone laptop less occasionally I'll be somewhere and think, gee, if I just had keyboard maestro right now, I could get something done really fast. And I, I, when I see people say that they want the Mac to get a touchscreen, uh, I mean, that's a complicated argument, but I, a lot of times when I listen to the argument, I think you say that, but what you really want is a iPad in a laptop and you don't think Apple's ever going to do that. So therefore you want the Mac to get iPadified. The iPad needs to be Macified way more than the Mac needs to get iPadified. And in fact, I think some of the ways they've made the Mac more iPad or iOS like in recent years have actually been mistakes. I think sandboxing on a Mac is great overall, but I feel like they got with 1014 maybe a little too strict. I don't know that that's I don't know that some of these restrictions where every single app that wants assistive touch or whatever they call it needs to get these permissions. I, I'm not quite sure what problem they're solving. It could well be that there are some security issues that I'm not aware of, and that they're closing some loopholes that really are causing people harm from malware. But I don't know. I you never really I still don't hear really about Mac malware. So. I, I kind of feel like they're, they're solving problems people don't have at this point. I would settle for that stuff being easier to manage. So like just the other day, uh, I had somebody, you know, hey, this app isn't working. And I was like, well, you got to open system preferences and go to security and give it like full disk access. And shouldn't that app or shouldn't the system be able to alert me that, hey, there's this new thing in place and you've got to create this permission? Like it just failed. And this user is like, well, I don't know. I don't know why it's broken. It didn't give me any sort of indication of what went wrong. And if you're going to add stuff to like a, a, a platform like the Mac, where it, it fundamentally changes the way that apps interact with each other in the system and your documents, it just feels like it's not fleshed out enough at this point, at least in 1014. I, I just can't think of much from the iPad that I want on the Mac that isn't there. I mean, it would be nice if messages <laughs> had, you know, the stickers and stuff, but... You know, it, it just seems like the other way around is is way more of a problem. I mean, I think you made the comment that uh, Mac users shouldn't be as upset as iPad users should be. And uh, I, I think there's some truth to that. What about the idea of a Mac that doesn't have an Intel chip inside of it? You've been banging the drum on that a lot over during Fireball. I think it's at this point, it's inevitable. Their 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 in house team is too good. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, and I know benchmarks are arbitrary. You know, running the Geekbench thing, it doesn't really prove anything in real life. And maybe actually with Geekbench in particular, the fact that it only takes like two minutes to run the whole thing is sort of misleading because maybe one area where we overestimate how easily the current Apple ARM chips could take over is for like exporting a 4k video that really bangs the CPU for half an hour, right? There's, you know, so I have a friend who works on a big app. I forget what, it, like a clean build of, of a major app that you've, we've all heard of takes like, I think like nine, 45 minutes or something like that. I don't know, but there's still certain things that, that, professionals do with a computer that taxes the CPU as 
as many cores as fast as they can go for sustained periods of time, which creates heat. And, and it's, you know, so I, I don't want to say it's easy, but the, the numbers on the benchmarks are so clear that it's, it's, there's Intel isn't competing with these chips anymore. It's they're really out of it. I mean, it's just the technical problem of, of, you know, getting developers to recompile their apps for it and, and stuff like that. But I think it'll definitely happen. And it's so funny because I just listened to it. It, it, this is, this seems to me to be the year where I've stopped being super sad about Steve jobs being dead. Like it, it's like enough years have passed for me at least where now I can go back and I've, I've watched a lot of his older keynotes in the last few months, like over Christmas and stuff. Um, and it doesn't, it's, it's, I can just enjoy them in a way that for a couple of years there, it always just seemed too tragic. You know, I don't know. And maybe that's just me, but uh, I just watched his introduction of the Intel transition and it's just amazing. It, it's one of the most, it, it, he does, it's ama- it, it fundamentally changed the, single most important thing in the company's product lineup. And it was like 11 minutes, <laughs> like 11 minutes on stage at WWDC. And the funny thing about it is that the argument that he made would apply exactly to a transition from Intel to ARM, that it's not just about performance, it's about performance per watt. And that they, and then he says something to the effect of, we have ideas for great new products that we can't build based on the power PC roadmap, but we can build them with Intel's and we're excited to do it. Right. It's like, and then you look at all of Intel stumbles the last few years and think hmm. history's history's back. Right. What gets me so excited about it is I feel like that's exactly what would happen. What could happen with the Mac. And, you know, it's clear where Apple wants to go with MacBooks because they called the one, the MacBook, right? The 12 inch MacBook is where Apple wants to go. And what's, what's the knock on the 12 inch MacBook? It's, super slow, right? I mean, everybody knows that's Intel's fault, right? They want, you know, they want to build a Mac that doesn't need a fan and yet can go really fast. And I, I just feel like, man, they could get going with their ARM chips and they could build a MacBook that makes the 12 inch MacBook look thick and heavy. And then they could use the extra space to put a keyboard in with actual travel. And then you could get one. There you go. I laugh. I laugh. But honest to God, that would be like if they, you know, Tim Cook called me and said, look, sign this NDA. We want to pick your brain. We're going to build what you want us to build. And honest to God, what I want them to build, use your arm chips, make the computer part of it super tiny. I mean, look, I mean, look at the actual computer part of an iPhone uh 10s. That's that's plenty powerful enough to drive a, a Mac. It, we see the numbers. So use that tiny little computer and then fill the rest of the space with a big, nice keyboard. <laughs> that's all I want. So if you uh, so put your pundit hat on, do you think we're going to get the ARM Mac in 2019? I mean, I, I know you, you're not in, in Apple, but w- what do you think? I have no inside information yeah. on this. I actually, I actually probably have, even though I, I, I think I'm, as you know, I, I used to hear a lot more stuff like that and I don't anymore. Like, I think the Apple actually has gotten better at, at keeping secrets. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I used to have, I have to have to make this disclaimer all the time because I'd make predictions and people would assume that I was getting information. And sometimes I was, and I, you know, but now I'm not. Uh, so 2019 to me is a close call. I'm going to guess, I'm going to say there's a maybe... A forty percent chance, and if not, then I feel like twenty twenty looks like a greater than fifty percent chance. But I'm going to say thirty five to forty percent chance that that we'll hear about that at, at WWDC. Do you think they're going to do like traditionally, where they they move the whole line over to the new chip, or this is just going to be on laptops? I see that to me is a huge question. Like, so the two previous transitions, when they went 68K to PowerPC, then when they went PowerPC to Intel, were complete transitions across the board. Um, all both times in about 18 months or maybe even less, you know, like within a year, they'd replaced all the, you know, the old ones with the new. I could see them doing that, and there's certainly some reasons for it. But on the other hand, it's it's completely unproven. We know Apple's internal in-house chip team can do fantastic mobile chipsets, right? I mean, they lead the industry. And so could they make a great one for a MacBook? Absolutely. Could they compete with Intel's you know, professional Xeon chips at the high end? I don't, it's, it's a complete unknown. I don't know. Maybe. But we don't know. 
And do they know? I don't know. And do they want to? Because obviously that's like a low volume type thing, whereas they seem, you know, more. So I could see it both ways, you know, but it's it's a complete unknown whether they, they can compete with that. And then the other factor on that is if they hadn't been so open in the last year and a half about the Mac Pro in, in, in truly uncharacteristic for Apple way, we'd all be saying, well, maybe what they'll do is just get rid of the Mac Pro, Right. Like if they had kept their mouth shut about this Mac Pro thing and they were still just selling the goofy trash can Mac Pro with at these prices from five years ago with the performance from five years ago uh, and not saying anything about it, then I, I think we would all be convinced. I don't even know if we'd be debating it. We'd say, oh, what they're going to do is switch to ARM and get rid of the Mac Pro. But we know that they're instead they're doing the opposite, right? So they've already said there's going to be a Mac Pro that will have a reason to exist, even with the iMac Pro being in the lineup. And the iMac Pro is a very nice pro desktop. I'll tell you, I'm actually really excited because I feel like they have got the message on iPad and we are going to get some power features soon. And I do think we're going to see this interesting transition with the Mac that uh, is probably going to be good for the Mac overall. And I. I don't know. I, I don't know. Like you said, who knows when this is all going to happen, but as people who are interested in this stuff and, and use these products, I think we've got a lot to look forward to. One of the things is that, you know, and Steven's recent video, I, I just linked to it, which I loved about the, uh, the 12 inch power book G4. Um, like one of the things, like I linked to that and I got so many <laughs> Twitter comments from people who are like, and that keyboard was fantastic. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it is really good. <laughs> it's a really, it was a really good feeling keyboard. Um, but one of the, it just, you just at that era when that was the state of the art power book, it, it just looked so much better than anything else on the market. There was just a sort of instant, you didn't even have to know, you didn't have to look at what software it was running. It's just, just the machine itself was like, man, nobody's competing. Like Apple is kicking, kicking ass. I feel like, you know, and it's not really Apple's fault too much. I don't think, I don't know how much they could do with their current options from Intel, but you know, the, uh, the, the competition has caught up or in some ways, right? I mean, like Microsoft Surface Laptop is a nice laptop. It's, you know, and it, and it has a nice keyboard and it has a really nice display. I feel like it's Apple's place to make laptops that that are so far instantaneously, like, wow, nobody else could do that. And I feel like switching to their own chipset with way lower power consumption and tremendous performance and no need for a fan and this great graphics performance that we see on the iPad. I mean, it's just, you think about the graphics on iPad, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy that they are driving this retina display with a tiny, you know, something this thin and zero lag as you move your finger around. Um, I feel like that it could be terribly exciting what they do with uh, MacBook hardware designs in in the future. Like I feel like people are just thinking about it in terms of performance. And I don't think I don't think they're thinking enough about the what you could do to reduce the physical bulk of a of a MacBook. Well, hopefully we'll find out. Yeah, I'm it's it's 2019. I'm very excited. I feel like there's all sorts of stuff to look forward to. Well, well John, thanks so much for coming on. I know it's been several years and we really appreciate having you on and, and hearing about your workflows and what you think is going on over at Apple. If anybody's interested, I highly recommend uh, just subscribing to the RSS feed over at Daring Fireball, listening to the talk show. Just a great podcast. And um anywhere else people should look for you, John? No, that's enough. We are the Mac Power <laughs> Users. You can find us over at relay.fm slash MPU. And um, if you'd like to join in the conversation, we've got that great discourse forum over at talk.macpowerusers.com. And uh, we'll have a, a post up just for this episode. So if you've got thoughts on what you're going to do with your ARM Mac, that'd probably be the place to say it. Uh, thanks to our sponsors uh, today. That is our friends over at Gazelle, Text Expander, Luna Display, and Eero. And we'll see you all next week.